Yes. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for inviting me in the first place. And thanks to all of you for being interested, joining either here in this uh, early morning session or uh, virtually. I would like to talk a little bit about our research or our work, which I sometimes describe as uh, we analyze images or we um, process images, which is the application, the uh, methodological, you know, setup surrounding of it is computer vision, machine learning. And our focus is very narrow. So we are only interested in image data that has been generated in a hospital and even more so image data that is 3D, CT, MR, uh, X-rays, could be 3D reconstructed, ultrasound for that matter, could be preclinical image data if it's about research, but 3D image data is what our focus is on. And uh, with this, we um, are part here of the Unispital. We are also part of the UCH, Department of Quantitative Biomedicine. And I would like to take you on our journey that starts with the images that we typically get from our clinical collaborators uh, that we turn into quantitative information and that we use at the end to help in diagnosing the disease process. Now, this is what I meant. So this is a snapshot of different images we used in clinical studies during the past years. You would see metabolic images, metabolic information, uh, there is CT images, there are a couple of annotations by experts or by machines. Uh, there are MR images, you see glioma, which is a very prominent topic of interest of ours. You see the slightly more generic uh, part that is, you know, given a whole body image scan or just a large scan, large field of view, find any anatomical structure that's in there and uh, give it a name or put it differently, go to a voxel in this volume and, you know, tell what is the uh, anatomy, what's the organ in that point. Obviously, the part on the right, this anatomical localization is a little bit of a, a technical contribution. So that's something that is not a driving clinical interest, but that is of uh, quite some relevance for us to structure information, to parse these image data, to uh, automate what a radiologist, neuroradiologist, nuclear medicine specialist uh, is, is able to do anyway. So this is the data I would like to um, um, showcase a few examples of our work on this anatomy, localization, and also applications in particular about glioma, um, some of the bone lesions that you would see in the top left, multiple myeloma as well. Why is this of interest? Why would I, as a computer scientist, have this super narrow focus, if you think of it? Um, so it's a super speciality. Um, and, and there is not just me. There are like thousands of me, I think, worldwide. Um, the reason is here, um, I always present this number, I really like it a lot. Uh, it essentially says that all the data that is generated in a hospital like, like the Unispital is never erased. And since the introduction of digital data some 25, 30 years ago, uh, none of the data has been erased. That, I, I, I'm not 100% sure, but Unispital, but I know for sure about 80% uh, of all the data acquired in Germany and 25% of the data uh, in, in Europe, uh, for sure, because um, I talked to the person who essentially sits on that uh, and, and who offers this, this storage as a service. So there's a massive data there, uh, as probably in, in the civilian uh, part of, of, of any data stored worldwide. Um, it, it, it's a significant uh, chunk. Most of it you see from our application is in oncology, and this is what I would like to uh, focus on. Now, this idea to get from images, to quantify them, and to have data at the end, that's something that um, has been popularized by um, um, Philip Labine and others uh, by the term of radiomics. And what you would see here is this radiomics pipeline. You take an image, you uh, find whatever you're interested in. Here it's the glioma and its substructures. You extract descriptors of it, so in a very standardized manner, so that you get essentially uh, a, a description of local textures, of shape information, of intensities, of relative changes. And you can use this uh, standardized information, this vector, and correlate it with whatever you're interested in. Clinical information, genetic information, um, this phenotype, genotype correlation is something where, where images are quite helpful, any predictive test. And this is this is kind of, if you go from, uh, let me see, 
if you go all the way from here to here, this would be the standard radiomics pipeline. What we, and this is the end beyond part, what we focus a little bit on is after we have invested all the efforts to, I don't know, not only uh, develop some algorithms that do image segmentation, there's a lot out there, but also to, to make them work, uh, to apply them to lots of data, and um, to, to get all the point that you have this here, we, as the group here, uh, as my group, a few others do the same, uh, try to go and, and try to interpret these images with uh, uh, functional disease progression model. So there is a lot of functional disease progression modeling, but we uh, are particularly interested in using these models for describing all this information that you see here. Time courses, for example, as the most obvious one. Good. Um, now, um, different work um, for, for most of them are quite naturally part of what we have done, have we worked on in the last couple of years. This is only a tiny snapshot. Uh, I would like to focus today on these two application domains. One is this image segmentation. So if you go to one of our conferences uh, on medical image computing, the conference has an interesting name. It's called MICAI, Medical Image Computing and Computer Assisted Intervention. So everybody who uses uh, uh, imaging within a surgical theater is also part of our community. Now, but what you would do then in 80% in of all time is segment images. And this is a big chunk. This is this, this process of having an image that is just a grayscale uh, array, 3D array, 4D array, into something that, that has meaning, that has semantic information, where you can uh, add a particular name understanding to, to individual components. So this is this is the one big chunk. Auto segmentation is, uh, it's sometimes called uh, from the more clinical fields or post-processing as an Emma physicist would call it. So this bit. Uh, the other part is the modeling I would also like to introduce a little bit. Now, um, I told you already that this idea of parsing um, a, a scan, whole body CT here, MR, and trying to identify all anatomical structure at a granularity level that makes sense for a given task, uh, a, a set of, of anatomical descriptors is something that, that we um, very like would develop and would like to have, essentially, because on the one hand side, we have just the scan, on the other, we can uh, do any, any um, statistical analysis on the other side. I already told you that what we do practically is um, computer vision, you know, generalizing ideas that work well in 2D computer vision, uh, seeing how, how, how and where it can be used uh, for, for tasks, maybe for new tasks that are just enabled through these new algorithms in, in, in the medical imaging field. And then we have these, these very classical um, objectives. You need, want to detect something in the image, you want to localize it, um, you know, not, is it detect means is it present or not, is it there or not, uh, localize, is it rough, outlining, but think of bounding boxes, segmenting is this pixel-wise accuracy, maybe you want to classify it. And, and this is the, the, the machine learning part uh, that, that also covers uh, the biggest chunk of what we have. Now, um, if you could do this uh, very generally, then you could have this auto segmentation as a post-processing very close to your uh, scanner, maybe even as part of your scanner. And I'm pretty sure that for example, Siemens or Philips, um, that they, they have software available, algorithms that come pretty close to this. Um, pretty close is also the software that they have, so it's close to our software, um, and, and maybe they even have reason of not making it available, but this technology is just imminent. And uh, what you would have if, 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 if all of this worked well, then, well, you could um, essentially have, could, 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 could go to any a semantic representation that, that you like, Rutlex is, is something uh, you describe every structure that you see in, in whatever uh, feature and, and descriptor that you have, and you get this diagnostic vector that I already told you. With this, you can visit your favorite statistician or do it yourself and get the information that lung is a little bit abnormal, um, liver is way too large, and also there is a lesion, right? Or something that is suspicious. So this, this would turn this whole image processing business into something that is much more straightforward. And I don't wanna call it the vision because really it's an engineering task. It's just a matter of time that this would be implemented. Uh, and um, well, we are part of uh, working towards that direction. And here is a current project. 
that has exactly this objective. Um, I will tell you a little bit later about data and open data. I already pointed out to you that whatever Siemens has and others is closed. Uh, we would like to make here an effort to um, make a significant uh, large data set available. We are talking here about 20,000 CT images with 170 plus anatomical structures annotated. Um, there are a few more than what you would see here so that you essentially can apply these algorithms that we have trained on the data, so convolution neural network, where everybody can train their favorite algorithm and you can retrain it in three years when whatever uh, better algorithm transformer has replaced CNNs, for example. And um, um, you, get a, 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 you get the means to essentially get a full dense annotation of, of the human anatomy. And also, you know, this is, this is meant as something that um, starts as a collection. So refinement, uh, additional anatomical structures can be integrated. So this is current work. Um, first step uh, we have done, and um, we are very much interested in, in testing any of that. So if you, if you had use cases for that, uh, data, I don't know, clinical studies or whatever, willingness to tell us more about the qualities that we have segmented here, uh, then let's chat. Now, um, that was the part that is a problem people like me make up, right? So nobody would try to find the left kidney if the, the patient has a, a lung condition. So even if it's possible, you wouldn't just do it. Um, most images are acquired for a reason. And then you have this focus on just what you're interested in. And, and that's also something that we obviously um, look into a lot, um, leaving all the anatomy aside. Uh, the, if you have, a, for example, a glioma patient, then all the focus, all the interest is just this lesion. It's a little bit the surrounding, surrounding organ. You have structures that you want to find. They have names, the demer, solid core, there are definitions. Uh, obviously, the outlines, the definitions depend a little bit on the sequences that you have, T1, T2, flare, with and without gadolinium. Um, you, you get um, these label maps and substructures of a tumor. And um, again, here's the problem. Where would you and how would you possibly uh, train your algorithms on? Because data is not easily available. And um, what we started to alleviate this problem uh, is a, a community effort. It's a a benchmark challenge. We essentially make an effort to make data available, anonymized, uh, annotated, pre-processed for from from the hospital. You know that follows common clinical uh, acquisition protocols, diagnostic protocols. Make it available to computer scientists, community computer vision, uh, machine learning, probably as well, and um, ask them to train their algorithms to, to um, optimize them, or just to use this data set as another experimental data set where they show how great the nearest transformer would be, for example. This is being done, so we now get a lot of algorithms, and when, then we essentially invite uh, these, these uh, fellow computer scientists, computer vision experts, to um, apply them under standardized conditions that we can control in the cloud, on a test set that we have that follows the same diagnostic um, um, standards. And um, what we get back then is um, um, a set of algorithms. And that's a bit of a bidirectional translational effort. So we kind of formalize the problem, make data available. We get back um, algorithms and can make them available to the clinics. So between computer science, machine learning, and clinics. This is um, since more than 10 years. It's um, super um, successful. I, uh, even, even when being modest, I think I can say that. Uh, it's the biggest, largest, longest running, most participants um, uh, landmark challenge that is out there in this community that I was just pointing out, Mikai, uh, which absorbs this, this international group of medical image pro uh, processing people. Um, we have several thousands of data sets made available publicly with open licenses. And whoever of you try to make data available, you know, to the public um, uh, and, and try to get the ethics approval for all of that knows what, what kind of effort that is. They're all annotated um, by experts. And also we had um, several thousands of teams of computer scientists who spent a few months in the summer essentially to work on these problems. Um, I don't know how many hours it will be uh, to, to test the algorithms. This obviously um, um, provides some visibility. So we teamed up for two, two years ago, for example, with large professional societies, getting their input from radiologists, their annotations, more data, and so on. So that's a, 
a very uh, um, good application um, just as a, uh, uh, well, obviously uh, it helps in solving this uh, glioma image segmentation quantification task, but it's also one of the driving um, um, challenges benchmarks from our community. And um, for example, it was used in, in one of the, well, in the largest worldwide federative learning network as a, as a reference task like la just last year. And um, here you would see the, the kind of contribution. It, kind of, it, it essentially uses public data, you see TCIA here, we're using Docker containers. This is the way we guarantee that test sets have not been touched by the participants. It's just that they don't see them. We just get their Docker, supply them on our end in the cloud and um, um, report results as, as in segmentation accuracies. What do we get out of it? I was talking about bidirectional translation. Well, this, this is an example, and um, it's actually one of the worst cases out of 2,000 segmentations. And I don't know, um, probably some of you know much more about neuroradiology and neurology and glioma than I do. Um, I think, you know, if, if, if a false positive white matter lesion is the only problem that you have in a the segmentation, then um, I think um, the algorithm has done quite a few things. Uh, uh, already. All of this um, can obviously be, you know, multiple algorithms can be combined. It's part of a, a, a large processing pipeline um, that, that is um, available. The algorithms themselves, we ask the participants to make available as well. Now, um, this is segmentation. Um, this is challenges. And, and we have repeated this challenge business several times um, for some of the images that you have seen. Uh, liver segmentation with tumors, um, um, spine segmentation. We have an extremely refined spine model and spine task for CT. Uh, we have done it uh, for uh, dental, um, very uh, broad range. And obviously, it's not just us. It's, it's, it's part of the community. Um, we have done a few um, methodological um, evaluations like uncertainty quantification as part of it. But let me talk, point out just one particular one that is uh, um, part of MIKAI 2023. The um, uh, challenge has just started last week or 10 days ago. So if any one of you is um, interested in uh, um, vessel segmentation, in particular uh, the circle of builders, um, follow closely. I'm, let me know. I'm happy to keep you posted. If any one of you is designing computer vision algorithms that um, align with multi-class segmentation of tubular or quadrilinear structures, which is just these vessels that we have there, uh, then feel free to participate. I'm happy to tell you more. Um, and it's a joint effort here with Suzanne Wegner from Neurologie at USAT, where we essentially uh, make this effort to, to understand the variability uh, of um, the circle of villas and, and the various anomalies that you would have there. So wh whether or not certain interconnections uh, are complete or what their diameters are, you see here, it's a, a, a rather complex 3D geometry. And what we're interested in is uh, getting the means out of it, right? The computer algorithms that come back on the other side uh, to, to um, process these data, to structure them, to uh, stratify them. Annotation has happened in um, 3D with uh, virtual reality support. That's essentially not, not yet the Google Glasses, but um, the Vision Pro, but, but some established ones uh, where the 3D annotation is, is easier. You can imagine that uh, annotating slices, um, just intersecting slices for a complex 3D structure is everything that then easy. And, and this is why we switched to 3D. Top cow is the name. Now, um, that's the part that is um, structuring images, quantifying the visual information, uh, supporting the uh, um, uh, radiologists, neuroradiologists uh, as much as possible, adding quantities that, you know, at a scale they would never uh, bother to, 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 to extract. For example, circle of villas, you could just use it for every scan. Um, spine, you could segment every spine in the patient that you have and try to see whether there are correlations um, for some sort. Um, but that, that's this part. And um, um, the analysis just mentioned is, is, is uh, correlations, diagnostic rules, radiomic, descriptors, algorithms. 
Um, what we are interested, after we have done all the segmentation effort, uh, um, and, and we also have the data, you know, probably several time points, that's complex to analyze in the first place. Also for a radiologist, and it's possible, but it's complex, it costs time. And, and this is where, where we look into this functional disease progression modeling. Example here, multiple myeloma. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a mixture of both, so it's, it's, it's multiple myeloma and it's um, uh, uh, prostate cancer, so that's it. Um, we have um, anatomical annotations, so we know where anatomical structures are in this slightly older model. It's, it's much coarser than what we can do now. Um, that's the CT. We have information of uh, true positives um, in, in the, in the, in the uh, 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 tracer up uptake, and we have that for several time points. And what we are now interested in is to go essentially to every of these lesions that we can localize in their anatomical context that we can find again the next time point, whenever that is. And we can now uh, start studying how this lesion evolves over time, how the distribution of lesions uh, evolve over time, because we have two processes. The one is the individual lesion that grows larger or reacts to treatment. And the other is the appearance of new lesions. And then there is even a, a, a third level that is like, what is the common pattern of um, lesions appearing first in certain parts of the body versus in other parts, and, and this is a population perspective, um, like a third level. So lesion, the patient tumor volume, uh, the, 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 the distribution of the population that you could now start studying. And um, we did this here for this uh, PSMA PET CT um, uh, study. It's uh, from um, Marco Schweiger at TUM, a few years old, and the, the the idea was, the question was, can we differentiate patients by local tumor evolution patterns? And what we had here was the evolution of the lesions for one patient class and the other. And um, if you just um, look into whether the, the lesions grow or shrink, we see very distinct um, um, patterns, um, not, not spatially, but temporally and dynamically. Here, these two examples, we have one patient where all the lesions grow in the other example, we have uh, partially growing um, lesions and shrinking lesions, and this is now a, a new level to group patients into, into responder types. If you have this information, not just on the three largest lesions, but all of them, and um, you might have this conflicting information that some grow, others don't. Uh, what could also be that all obviously respond, and, and, and this gives you some more granularity uh, um, for, for differentiating. Uh, um, uh, treatment um, um, success, for example. Now, um, this is multiple myeloma now, as I said. Uh, we have this global information, all the tumor load that, that is present in the patient. Uh, we have the individual local lesions that we can look at and trace. So what we were interested in here was essentially, can we uh, describe the local lesion um, growth over time? So, you know, what's the mathematical formula that you could use is the growth proportional to the volume of the tumor, to the surface of the tumor. Is it just a diffusive process uh, with a certain cell doubling rates? Um, and, and we could test that on, on a fairly large um, data set from, from Heidelberg University. And uh, we could also integrate, now ask the question, what is the, um, the growth over time? Like the dissemination, that is the, the, the appearance of new lesions, what is out growing um, the, um, the, um, 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 the, the, the forward progression of the disease in this particular cohort, which was a cohort of early stage uh, multiple myeloma patients. So it was a watchful waiting concept they had back in the days where just one or two of these uh, um, um, multiple or uh, smoldering myeloma uh, patients um, uh, rare and uh, well, smoldering myeloma patients were present um, and, and, and um, there was essentially uh, monitored what, what would happen. And, and the question of having a, a good descriptor that tells about uh, a, uh, um, the, um, uh, the, the advancement of, of the disease process was what we were interested in. And, and this is essentially what we got out of it. We could segment all the lesions in these volumes over time. You see here time, you see volume. Uh, you see it's a pretty exponentially growing process and we could stratify uh, the group of patients where this growth was really fast uh, and a group where we had just very, very, very um, uh, 
um, slow growth uh, observed. And what we essentially were using was a um, intermediate model that was combining this, this idea of individual lesions growing and also uh, having this um, dissemination, this, this, I don't want to call it metastasization process, but this appearance of new lesion, lesion um, that, that was uh, assumed to be exponential. We had a, a, a joint model that we could fit and essentially the B that you would see here in the, in the, the lower equation is the exponent exponent of of the uh, curves on the right hand on the left hand side and if you use that to separate uh, the one group from the other then you would see that um, just the low risk patients and the high risk patients can separate very well by this um, um, this this approximative uh, um, um, speed of growth parameter that we could induce here now um, that was one. Um, I was promising glioma, and um, it's actually a um, field of research, um, the modeling part, um, also since a long time, 10 years more, 15 years almost. And um, there is a, a lot of, um, well, a lot of formal input, a part of it. Um, it, it. There is a lot of compute, let's put it that way. Um, for example, here you would see that we start with the images, right? So this is the image data. Uh, we have to somehow establish uh, the uh, extract the information that is relevant to inform a tumor growth model. Could be outlines that are visible in the different images. Could be something that is visible in metabolic maps, like here in FATP PET map that we had, that is assumed to be proportional to tumor cells. Um, we are using um, anatomy, and this is a reason why uh, these tumor growth models um, um, may be of interest to use here and there because the tumors grow tumors grow and, and they're influenced by their anatomy in the surrounding um, and and this surrounding think of a tumor that is um, at the at the cortex you know really frontal cortex for example can only grow in one direction if you would now uh, try to extract a speed of growth parameter from this tumor and it's just a single-sided direction, right? So there's no, no, no growth in all three directions possible. So you might underestimate the dynamics of this tumor. While a tumor that sits very centrally in the white matter can grow in all three areas, uh, this would have a, a, a very uh, unidirectional um, expansion possible. And um, kind of moderating or um, regressing out this, this, these differences is something that a considering these differences is something that an anatomy model uh, would be using for the brain. It's gray matter, white matter, CSF. So CSF, obviously, there is no growth, and, and white and gray matter it is. We have a fairly simple growth model. So um, it's a descriptive one. Uh, it just has these two equations. It's a you know, diffusive process so cells migrate into areas with uh, lower concentrations of tumor cells. There's a proliferation term, and I could use different ones. And essentially, this is the forward growth that we have. Uh, and, and the key question now is, and there are many different strategies, and this is where we add our, our, uh, our, our brains and, and, and our added info, is essentially uh, the inverse modeling. The, um, um, for example, a Bayesian inverse modeling that you would see here that allows us to link image information with the parameters of this model and um, to use them um, for estimating at the end, a distribution of tumor cells and use this for um, example in radiotherapy planning. Now, what does that mean? You see a set of images, um, FAT PET, uh, standard MR protocol. Uh, we can use the tumor segmentations. We use this Fischer Kolmogorov uh, model, is its name, with this Bayesian inference. Uh, there are ways to accelerate this uh, with neural networks. Uh, to have a fast start, we get the uncertainties, we have the tumor cell distributions, we get the parameters of this model, this diffu diffusion rate and the proliferation rate, and we can use that to uh, get uh, tumor cell distribution maps. What are the tumor cell distribution maps good for? Well, um, Jan Unkelbach had one answer here already 10 years ago. You see, you see uh, a publication here, so that was uh, um, even before Jan came here. Um, if you have this, you can directly put this in the linear quadratic cell kill model 
and optimize radio radiation therapy plans for it. And if you would have here the outline of a regular tumor, then this is the tumor cell distribution that uh, you would get by combining the most simple tumor cell growth model, left-hand side equation, ours, and Jan's uh, linear quadratic model, uh, and the optimization for radiotherapy. And if you compare it against what the traditional approach would be with just two centimeters of margin uh, uh, around whatever is visible as a tumor, then you see there is a massive difference, right? So these black outlines is where you would have 60 grays. This is something that, you know, gets, gets closer to, to uh, this, this uh, biology response. Now, um, as I said, the key idea would be to use this together with this anatomical information that's in there for informing better radiation therapy plans. We have done some retrospective evaluations that work quite well, and we are looking forward to uh, do this in a smaller um, prospective trial. Good. Um, this is essentially um, the overview. Um, I did not tell you about these two. Please ask me if you're interested. Ask me uh, um, uh, in the coffee break. So it's essentially about quantitative MRI, fingerprinting. That is something that we like a lot as image processing specialists because it integrates machine learning already into uh, the MR signal processing. And if you have that available, then you can pull in all the uh, structural segmentation business right into the, uh, into, into the acquisition. And you can tune the acquisition to get much better signals. Uh, something we started to look into for glioma. I would very much love to continue at some point. Radiomics, well, the key business here is to have the data and to have a uh, have the sufficient data set and to test it. So this is really uh, on the clinical side. So it's not necessarily 100% of what we are doing, but um, uh, you have a predictive test here and um, representation learning um, to make this a stable test with very few cases, I don't know, 5,000 negative cases and 120 positive cases. Uh, that's essentially the task to learn with something like that. Um, that boils down to representation learning for neural networks, they, which themselves have millions of parameters. Um, that's um, something we uh, have um, looked into here as well. There is more um, pretty pictures, just um, in case any of that is of relevance to you. Um, uh, let me point out the one that, that I already had referenced for our uh, uh, circle of villas segmentation challenge. We do a significant um, amount of our more methodological work in the segmentation of 3D uh, vascular structures, graph-like structures, where we can make data available, have tools for extracting the graphs, for studying flow along it, and um, um, essentially to, um, to, to, to push the limits of, of what this graph processing uh, can do in, in, in 3D representations. That's essentially it. Obviously, it's not just my work. It's a large group. There are lots of collaborators. Let me just point out here uh, our group uh, and our um, uh, various funding agencies. And as I already said, thanks to them, but also thanks to you for being interested and uh, joining uh, the session here today. Thanks. Thank you very much uh, for the nice introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Um, as uh, was just said, I'm going to talk about uh, spinal cord injury, and you will see that uh, um, coming from uh, Dr. Menz's um, talk, he goes from big data, we talk here about um, rather small data sets. Um, I do not have any uh, disclosures to make. And first of all, I would actually acknowledge all the people that were involved, because you will see Spinal cord injury is a quite small field, it's an orphan disease. And so that we can do data science, we're actually really dependent on, on clinicians, on collaborators that collect data for us. So in order we can process the data. So um, I have the honor to present this work, but it's, it's really a team effort. And I would like to point this out. Also the funding agencies without their support, it wouldn't be possible. Okay, so traumatic spinal cord injury is, a, is an orphan disease, it's, it has a, quite low incidence, but it's actually very devastating. And you can see on this image here, we have a, um, um, a rupture of the spinal cord uh, due to a, a car accident. And this patient was se severely injured and um, is now lifelong bound to the wheelchair. And there are different uh, causes of, of these injuries. Uh, you can imagine these are the data uh, or the, the stats, the numbers for Europe. 
in the United States, the gunshots are actually about uh, 48%. So you can also see there are quite some differences. Um, it affects men more than women. Um, this was always justified by men being uh, more prone to um, taking more risks and also work in more risky jobs. But we will see also um, how this actually changes a little bit over time. And just uh, a broad uh, classification. So we talk about tetraplegia if all the four limbs are affected and paraplegia if only uh, the lower limbs are affected. And spinal cord injury is a very uh, special neurological disorder because it's one of the few disorders where patients are severely injured and then have somewhat of a recovery. Usually in neurological disorders, you have a disease progression that goes with a worsening of the patient state. But here, when we look on the group level, we actually see we have an accident and then we have this nice trajectory of some recovery. And um, here it's for the motor function. So let's just assume the walking function. Um, but this is true also for sensory function and autonomic functions. However, if you look at the individual level, you can see there is a massive heterogeneity in how patients recover, where they start, how they recover, and where they end up at 12 months. So we say at 12 months, the, the injury is chronic, it starts to be chronic, and no improvement can happen anymore. So we try to make everything happen in the first six months to 12 months in order to push their recovery as far as possible. And while there is some recovery in, in lots of these body functions, there is actually no cure for spinal cord injury. And the reason why this, we do not have a cure is all the clinical trials in our field have either failed or were early terminated because of low sample sizes because of financial reasons. So it's, it's actually, for the patients, it's, it's very sad. And also as a, clin as a researcher in this field, um, it is, uh, it, it's, um, it's just disappointing that we have not found anything yet. But if you look at the news, you would think that data science is actually the tool to solve everything. And so you can see this from MS to COVID. COVID is the latest example. With data science, apparently, this is the holy grail. Um, so we should try to do this as well. And we have started to do this in the fields of um, spinal cord injury or short SCI but it is still in its infancy. And I will show you why uh, we're just at the beginning. Where do we use data science? Um, in biomarker discovery. So we look at different uh, like omics data or blood data to look for biomarkers that are predictive of outcome or progression, or um, even biomarkers that could potentially tell us who will respond to certain treatments or not. Also drug repurposing. So we have a lot of information about these patients, um, what kind of drugs they receive to treat secondary complications. Because spinal cord injury is not just injuring the spinal cord. If you injure the spinal cord, you have cardiovascular problems, breathing problems, um, bladder problems, bowel problems, pain. So these patients receive a ton of drug, drugs to treat these secondary complications. And some of these drugs we actually found to be effective to improve the recovery to a certain extent. We use it for disease surveillance and monitoring, patient monitoring to see how patients progress. Uh, do they progress as they should? Um, or uh, is there something that hampers their recovery? And also clinical trial enrichment. We just finished a clinical trial in the field where we could enrich the clinical trial like to add a third, to add a second placebo arm with purely historical data. And this is the first time that the European Medical Association actually allowed us to do that in order to finish the clinical trial. Because as I said before, often these clinical trials are early terminated because of the um, low patient recruitment. But today, I'm just going to focus on the disease surveillance and monitoring and try to show you how we use the data or data science. Uh, approaches in order uh, to facilitate disease surveillance and monitoring. But before I do that, I would like to point out a few challenges. And I'd like to ask you to keep these challenges in mind when I present my results, because these challenges are very important. So first of all, data availability. So in, in machine learning and data science, we would love to have large data sets, meaning thousands of patients. In spinal cord injury, 
we have very small data available. And this poses um, very specific challenges uh, for the data, for the modeling, but also from an ethical and, and data privacy reason, uh, perspective. The disease is that it has a very high heterogeneity in terms of the clinical presentation. So how is a patient injured? Also, where do they start in terms of their functional recovery? And also, how do they recover? What treatments they receive? What secondary complications they have? And if you have a high heterogeneity, you would actually need even more data to counteract this heterogeneity or to account for this heterogeneity. Then we need a lot of domain knowledge, um, which is not a challenge. It's not a bad thing. It's just you need to have a lot of interactions with clinicians, with experts that can give you this domain knowledge in order to train your models. And then we have the privacy concern. So with all data science uh, or medical data science projects, there's always a privacy concern. In spinal cord injury, this is even more concerning because you can actually identify a patient by just knowing how they were injured. Like if you have enough scores about their injury characteristic and you know from which center they're coming, you can actually identify the, this, the patient. And this is highly problematic because that's what we try to avoid. And so with these challenges in mind, I would like now to go over and present one of our projects where we use data science uh, in order to do disease surveillance. So what is the goal of disease surveillance? We would like to see how um, to detect changes in the epidemiological landscape. So how uh, changes, for example, sex or age at at injury, um, and we identify temporal and spatial changes in the population structure. But we also ask the question, did um, the, the extent of the functional and neurological recovery after an injury change in the last 20 years? Meaning, if you have an injury today, are you recovering better than 20 years ago? And just thinking, there, there were so many advances in the acute care, our hypothesis was that it actually changed the way how patients recover so that they recover better uh, these days. And for this uh, study, we used the European multicenter study about spinal cord injury, which is a European wide network with 22 centers. The time span was between 2001 and 2019. And you can see the distribution of the contributing centers. And you can see that um, Germany was actually the main contributor uh, to this data set. We have about 4,600 patients. And here you can already see the magnitude of, of what kind of data we work with. In 20 years, we have 4,000 patients to work with. Other fields have 10,000 per year. So just keep this in mind. Uh, this is very a particular, a particular challenge um, in this field. And we have all different kinds of information that were collected at predefined time points um, over the course um, over one year uh, from two weeks to 50 years, 50 weeks, 52 weeks after injury. And we did all kinds of statistical analyses. I'm going to show you here the linear effect models. We also tried machine learning models, but you can um, appreciate uh, with only 4,600 patients with a massive heterogeneity to deal with. And this obviously didn't work out as uh, planned. Now, how did the, the epidemiological landscape change? In terms of the female-male ratio, there wasn't actually a change. It's still uh, quite stable over the last 20 years. However, the age of the injury changed quite um, a bit. So early 2000s, um, it was a disease of the young uh, people. Now we can see a shift. Um, and we have two big peaks. It's a bimodal uh, distribution where we still have the young age peak, but also a peak at older age. And this can also be explained by the higher propensity of older people to do more uh, risky stuff, such as with the electric, electrical bikes. Um, there are more outdoorsy. Um, in general, the older population gets more adventurous. Um, but this has uh, some consequences, of course. And that's what we see in our analysis. In terms of the injury characteristics, so here uh, you can see the injury severity, Asia A being the most severe, Asia D being the least severe. Also here, we don't see a change. 
over the last 20 years, this distribution seems to be um, somewhat stable. You see some fluctuation, um, and this is true for the female and the male patients, um, but it's, it's, it's kind of stable. And the same for the lesion level. So was it in the cervical cord, uh, thoracic cord, or the lumbar cord? And this also uh, is stable. Um, you could think that there is a slight trend uh, towards uh, more cervical lesions as indicated um, a little bit up above, but it, it wasn't statistical significant. So uh, let's go with that for now. Now the neurological recovery. So here it's the recovery of the motor function. So how well you can move your muscles. Um, here we actually found a quite disappointing uh, finding because how much someone recovers did not change the last 20 years. And you can see this data is stratified according to the plecha, so um, which body part is affected, and the injury severity, because the injury severity actually is a predictor of how well someone recovers. You can see the Asia A's, they almost stay flat. They experience no recovery, but then the Asia D's, which were the least severe, injured patients, they, of course, they have more capacity to recover. And if we just look at, uh, so this is always spins in, four, in five years, uh, so that we have a, a little bit of better approximation. Uh, but you can see when we look at the years, you have this uh, recur recurring pattern of recovery over the years, um, but there's no trend upwards or downwards. So we can say it's robust because it also didn't get worse. But of course, from a patient's view, also, uh, from a clinician's view, um, this was actually quite disappointing. The same is true for walking function. Uh, also here, uh, we, we did not see any improvements, even though uh, we, we have a lot of new tools uh, for these patients to learn how to walk or to assist the walking, um, but the function recovery did actually not change. And this is quite uh, disappointing, of course. So what we found in this study was um, that the epidemiological landscape changed um, in terms of age of injury. And this is important um, when we would like to pull all the data uh, to do our reanalysis, but also when we uh, think about the design of clinical trials. However, the degree of the degree a patient with a spinal cord injury recovers has not changed which means from a data science point of view, this is actually a good thing because now we can um, better pool this data, use all the uh, data also uh, without having to be concerned about the so-called data shift. But of course, uh, from a clinical point of view, and this is quite disappointing. Another advantage of this disappointing finding is actually that we can enrich clinical trials. And that's what the EMA actually allowed us to do in just one of our recent uh, clinical trials. Now, okay, what can we do with this data? So the classical way is to use the data and then it goes in the graveyard. You use it for publication grants and then you put it in a database. But our vision is actually to bring the data back to the clinic so that we can do patient monitoring, also for the clinical trial design and implementation and the patient education, because at the end of the day, this is data from the patients, which they generously donate to us for our um, research, but we should uh, give them something back and uh, use it for patient education. Now, how can we use this data for patient monitoring? So we would like to see how a patient recovers over time and to see whether the recovery is as expected or not. So. In the clinics at the moment, these patients, uh, they stay with, let's say six months in the clinic and then they leave uh, the clinic and they come back for regular checkups. But what the clinicians do at the moment is that they see the patients and they're like, okay, fine, you're doing well, but they have no comparator data. And that's what we um, actually try to change. And also the goal will be to identify factors that can benefit the patients um, or to actually hamper the recovery. And so typically what we do is we have a new patient and we compare them to a huge control group. And you can see the control group obviously has a, um, a variance and the patient falls nicely into um, this variance of the control uh, cohort. But I challenge you on this view because I say this patient is actually underperforming. And I'm going to show you why I think this. 
And this is where the concept of a digital twin comes in. And the digital twin is just a virtual representation of a patient. So you, you collect as much data as you have uh, from a patient and you look for a digital twin. And it's, it's basically, you take data from multiple scales um, and you create a computational representation and then you can actually um, also enrich or integrate and personalize these representations with clinical data uh, from these individual patients. Now, in the context of spinal cord injury, we have, of course, only a few variables available, but we know that uh, certain factors are actually driving um, the recovery process. So for example, the lesion level, the lesion severity, surgical timing, so when after the injury uh, were, was the cord decompressed, uh, concomitant medication, uh, recurrent infections, and uh, blood marker levels. So for example, albumin levels were found to be predictive of outcome. Now, when we look for this digital patient for this new patient, so this new patient is actually um, a patient from a clinical trial, and we were looking for its, its digital twin. And we found the digital twin on all these uh, parameters I showed you. They have the same lesion level, same inj injury severity, um, similar um, concomitant meditation. And so it's not a twin twin. Let's call it a sibling, to be fair. But it's the closest neighbor as we can get so far. And you can see that this new patient should actually perform better um, when we believe that the digital twin is a true digital twin. Now we went back to the data to see what, what actually happened to the patients uh, to this time point here, because it seems that they underperform at this time point. And we went back and what we saw is that this patient has re had reoccurring infections that uh, required the treatment with um, antibiotics. And from the literature from previous uh, studies, we actually know that reoccurring infections um, do negatively impact the plasticity in the spinal cord. And also the treatment with antibiotics um, is uh, detrimental. So in this case, we could actually find out what was most likely the reason. I'm not saying it's, it's causal, but here at least uh, we found the reason to explain um, this patient. Of course, this is my representative example. It's not always that easy. Um, but it was a, it was a nice uh, use case. Now, what did we do with this data? Um, so in order to, so this, this of course is just research, but now we would like to translate this into the clinic. And we uh, built uh, this shiny app called Near Surveillance, uh, where we have all the data available uh, from, from two clinical trials, including, and also the, the EMSCI data, so the, the European network, which I showed you. And uh, it's in a way that you can explore all the data, but you cannot access the data. You cannot identify a patient, but you can uh, generate uh, research questions and you can look at the data. Now, if you look at this, it looks fancy. It's, it's a nice uh, research tool, but this of course cannot yet be implemented in the clinic. So as a next step, we're actually doing user research with, with a company and uh, with the Balgris Clinic to actually implement such a, such a, a tool like this neurosurveillance tool into the clinic so that the, the clinicians, but also the patients have access to all the data that's available in order to, to look at their um, recovery. And I'm just gonna, um, here's the, the link and you can scan and play around. It's an open uh, source but I just wanna quickly uh, show you this tool. So here it's the patient, the individual monitoring of the patient. So here you have all the patients and now you can actually select uh, based on the characteristic of your new patient, you can select from the historical uh, controls, your closest neighbor. So this goes into this direction of the digital twin, which patients share the same um, characteristics. Oh, sorry. And you can see like the numbers get always smaller because you, sh you look for um, similarities in your cohort, but the um, projection of the recovery is actually also getting smaller. So you have a higher confidence 
And for example, I asked clinicians whether they would trust such a tool. Um, and they said they would trust it more than just the entire cohort. Of course, the gut feeling is still the strongest um, decision maker for a lot of clinicians. But it, this just shows us how like, we can actually narrow down this um, prediction or this, this uh, where patients actually end up. And this is informative for the patients because they would like to know what is the chance that actually um, that I recover up here um, instead of just down here. Because if you look at the entire cohort, you can see um, that uh, the blue shaded area is the, uh, the variance of the population. So they can end up anywhere basically, and this is not very informative. And with that, I'm actually at the end of my talk, and I would like to thank you for your attention. And again, here's the, the link to the nearest event. Um, thanks a lot.
it's increasing. We have promised the audience, so I can just. Use oh, it's it. not working. So not your online audience. Okay, so um, let me step back a second. So this is, you know, basically um, um, an aggressive skin cancer. Um, it's actually in, increasing, um, you know, in, in the incidence rate. But what's interesting about multiple cell carcinoma, as I said, it's very aggressive, but it's also in, for the most part caused by a virus. And so when you're looking at immunotherapy, it provides an interesting target. And so when I was at the FedEx, we were involved in a large uh, collaborative project with um, which was led by my uh, colleague Paul Niem who is an expert on Merkel cell. So until recently there was really um, no very good treatment to treat Merkel cell. And with the events in immunotherapy, specifically with anti-PD-1, there was a trial that was done, which was called CITN09, for testing the efficacy of anti-PD-1 in the context of Merkel cell. Um, this was actually the press release from the FDA, and you can see that actually it was approved and it was actually quite effective. And so now we have a good treatment. Unfortunately, even though it's actually very effective, it's not effective for everybody, right? So you get about a 50% um, response rate. And only, you know, about 25% of, of patients will actually get a complete response. And so the question um, that we had in collaboration with my colleagues at the FedHudge was, you know, can we actually look at maybe the immune response, either at baseline or after treatment, to try to predict or understand why did we get that heterogeneity in the response? So one of the standard technologies that they use uh, for biomarker studies when you're looking at um, immunotherapy is basically flow cytometry. So flow cytometry is a very high throughput technology. It's actually very robust. It's pretty standardized. You get a blood sample. You can look at all the cells and try to look at the activity of the immune system. Um, Unfortunately, even though we get better and better technology where you can measure more and more proteins, you know, dozens or even 50 uh, proteins in a given sample, most of the analysis is still very manual, right? So basically what people will do is that they will basically look at, you know, 2D scatter plots. For some reason, this is not working. Oh, here we go. So they will look at a two D scatter plots where basically you have you know your your markers. For example, you look at CD three, which is expressed on T cells versus CD eight. The ones that are high for CD three, they are the T cells. Then you go in, in the other projection. You look at CD four, CD eight. You define your CD four positive T cells, CD eight positive T cells, and so on and so forth. So it's kind of a sequential approach where you look at these sort of two D scatter plots and you draw polygons uh, or gates around the populations of interest. So, of course, there's limitation in how you do that. First of all, you know, this is very time consuming and subjective. If you do it, I do it, we'll get different answers. And then, you, you know, if you have a lot of parameters, a lot of markers, a lot of proteins that you're measuring, there's a lot of different combinations, right? So you can only sort of look at what you think is interesting. So oftentimes you're sort of biased by what you already know, and therefore you're only going to quantify the populations of interest, and then you call it those with clinical response. So you might be sort of missing some of the biology. So we spent a lot of time working on these kinds of technologies in my lab, and specifically um, flow cytometry. And we had worked on lots of different approaches for doing this. But then we sort of thought, why if we, what if we try to do something similar to what's done manually, but automate that, data-driven, and also look at all combinations. So this is basically what we publish in an algorithm called FAST. I'm not going to go through all the details, but I'll give you basically the intuition behind it, what we're trying to do. So let's see, we'll look at T cells. So um, T cells are defined by the expression of CD3 on the surface. And so for the most part, these T cells will be positive. They, that is the expression or the quantification of the CD3 protein will be pretty high. Now these T cells might be expressing other kinds of, of molecules such as CD8, you know, in this case, CD28, CD69, PD1. It's bimodal because some cells will be on the left. They do not express the proteins. Some cells will be on the right. They express the proteins. Now, if I look at, let's say, these ones, they are all expressing these proteins, and therefore, they will be on the right side of that distribution, right? If I look at a cell that do not express CD28, that cell will fall on the left side of that distribution. So basically, by looking at distributions and knowing where the data point falls, whether on the left or on the right, I can sort of, you know, come up with a classification for that cell. So if I start, for example, with CD3 positive T cells, I will sort of look at um, cells that might be uh, positive for two other markers. So in this case, we have CD8. So we'll have CD8 positive cells on the right, CD8 negative cells on the left. And then we can go on and on and on. We can look at PD1, for example, you have PD1 positive, uh, CD8 positive T cells, and so on and so forth. 
And of course, you know, sometimes you have more than two levels of expression. You might have sort of three level of expression where some cells might have sort of an intermediate level of P1 expression. And so we can do that automatically. By the way, this is a cartoon. I'm just sort of showing you what the data sort of look like. And then we use density estimates. We look at the, you know, the cells that fall on the left and the right, and we can do that automatically. The beauty of this, obviously, is that why should we do this, right? Why should we start at CD3 and then P, uh, CD8 and then PD1? I mean, from a data point of view, you could argue that maybe you, you could do first CD3, then PD1, then CD8, right? Um, and you will arrive at the same sort of combination. So we actually sort of do that automatically. We, we look at pretty much all these combinations, looking at the different sort of cell subsets. And there's a lot of different combinations. And the, the advantage of doing this is that sometimes there will be, you know, some, some cells basically maybe that are sort of masking some of the signal. For example, if I look at T cells and the ones that express CCR7, you will see that if I look at that, the distribution will be kind of unimodal. It's kind of hard to find a separation between the CCR7 negative and the CCR7 positive cells. If I condition on CD8, maybe this will look like this. So basically by removing things that might not be interesting, I might sort of uncover structure in the data that will be sort of um, masked otherwise. So that's kind of the idea. We, we compute all these trees, look at all combinations. Of course, you get lots and lots of different trees, right, like this. And what we can do, and by doing all these trees, you will re-identify the same population, right? Because maybe if I do CD3, CD8, PD1, or CD3, PD1, CD8, I will arrive at the same population at the end. So what we can do is basically look at the consistency of the populations that basically we obtain through all these samplings of trees. And then we can sort of record that. And then we know this is a very robust population. It's probably real as opposed to just an artifact because there was a couple of cells that stayed positive for everything, for example. So this is kind of the main idea in the algorithm, right? So we, we do all these sort of uh, um, combinations of proteins, and then we obtain the, the populations this way. The advantage of this, obviously, is that we get uh, populations for which we know exactly what they are, because that's how we define them. For example, in this case, we'll know that the cells are CD3 positive, CD4 negative, CD8 positive, PD1 dim as opposed to taking all the data clustering and then getting a cluster and then trying to understand what's in my cluster, right? I mean, is it high for this or low for that? So kind of, you kind of have to do that sort of post-processing or labeling of the clusters. The other advantage is because we get a true label, so it's basically identifiable, we can actually compute that per um, sample. So we can analyze each sample independently and then obtain these labels and then compare across the different samples. And this is very important for those of you who do sort of basically um, omics analysis, you know, there's a lot of variation, it could be a lot of batch effect. And so by doing that, you can sort of compute these per sample uh, population statistics, and then you can normalize or align them across the different samples. Um, and we've shown that this worked quite well compared to other technologies. In fact, I'll sort of apply that to the, the uh, Merkel cell um, study that I mentioned. And this is the only technique that identifies some of these correlates I'll be describing next. So going back to that study, basically what they have done is used a um, T cell panel for understanding what was happening um, within these samples, right? The, the idea was to do a biomarker study to actually understand if we could identify specific T cell phenotypes Again, either at baseline or after treatment, that will be correlated with response. Here, I'm gonna focus on the baseline sample. So what I want to do, this was actually obtained from blood. So this was fresh blood that was taken from the uh, participant in the clinical trial. And then we're gonna look at basically doing these T cell phenotypes, identifying all T cells in these samples and seeing if there's different flavors of T cells that predict who responds to the therapy. This is a small study because this is exploratory. It's a biomarker study, there's 27 participants, 18 of which um, responded, and, and nine that did not respond to therapy. This is a T-cell panel, so they look at the traditional sort of naive memory markers and then, you know, exhaustion or activation markers. Again, our goal was just to look at the baseline samples. So we ran fast, so that computational approach for identifying the populations of interest, we actually obtained 230 phenotypes, so 230 um, subsets in the data sets. If I project those, you know, UMAP embedding, so if I do the traditional UMAP, so, you know, this sort of dimensional uh, reduction, and I project these cells in that two-dimensional space, you will see that all these populations are not very well uh, separated. 
The main reason for this is that because in the UMAP embedding, there's actually key markers that capture most of the variation. You can really distinguish between maybe more rare cell subsets. However, if you use the information that the algorithm is using and we create a new embedding, we actually see that maybe these 230 populations are very distinct. Now I told you that we want to focus on T cells, so I'm only going to look at the cells that were called CD3 positive, so T cell populations. What I'm showing you here basically is the frequency of uh, the, the T cell population. So let me just step back. So we obtain 125 CD3 populations, so 125 T cell subsets. Now we're correlating those with clinical response. So basically, we're going to try to find T cells at baseline that might have sort of a different frequency um, depending on whether you're a responder or non responder after therapy. So basically, this is what we're doing here. We're um, splitting the populations into two. So we're going to look at the responders in yellow versus the non-responders in magenta. And then we'll look at the frequency of these cells. There's actually four T cell subsets that were significantly different between the responders and non-responders, two in the CD4 compartment and two in the CD8 compartment. I'm only going to talk about the CD8 populations, but the story is the same for the CD4s. And so what you see that basically um, at baseline, if you have more frequency of the CD8 memory T cells that express CD28, PD1, and HLDR, you're more likely to respond. And this makes sense because this is basically anti-PD1. It's a drug that will block PD1 so that you're releasing the brakes on your T cells so that they can basically uh, cure cancer cells. So if you see if your T cells do not express PD1, the drug is unlikely to work. However, PD-1 alone was not enough. So when they actually did that biomarker study, they specifically look at PD-1 expression on these T cells at baseline, and this was not predictive. It was predictive if you were to do IC staining in the tumor, but in the blood, they couldn't identify that population as being predictive. The key uh, point here is that you had to look not only at, C at PD-1, but you needed the co-expression of PD-1, CD-28, and HLDR. This is kind of known in the literature because CD-28 has been um, shown to be very important, actually, for responses to anti PD-1, but this wasn't actually we really looked at when they looked at the manual strategy. Now, the other thing that's interesting, I told you very briefly early on that these, these um, for the most part, these um, tumors are actually positive for a virus called the polyomyelitis virus. And here what we see is that this signal tends to be actually stronger in the virus positive uh, participants of the virus positive tumors. So this might, this sort of led us to think that maybe what we're finding in the blood might be related to something that's, you know, specific to the, the virus. So we actually look at the correlation between these um, T cell uh, the frequency of these T cell populations and what's happening in the tumor specifically measured by TCR clonality. So we actually correlated the TCR clonality in the tumor. So TCR clonality is high, meaning low uh, T cell diversity or TCR diversity. The hypothesis being that if this is a virus positive tumor, maybe there's sort of a dominant epitope. And so this is being targeted by T cells, right? And this is sort of what we're seeing is that basically if we have more of these T cells at baseline in the blood, this is correlated with um, uh, higher clonality. And so this may, made us sort of hypothesize that maybe the frequency of these T cells we're picking in the blood are actually uh, very specific T cells uh, that are circulating that are also present in the tumor. So this needs to be confirmed because we couldn't redo really that. But this shows that basically we're able to pick up something in the blood that has an extremely low frequency that is predictive of therapy and probably related to uh, very specific T cells. We actually validated that. So after we submitted the paper, the reviewer asked, yeah, can you validate this? So we had to go back to the biobank. This time, this wasn't done on fresh blood, but on, on frozen PBMCs. And you can see the signal is still there. We even looked at another study where we, they actually looked at uh, melanoma. And we found that this was also predictive in the context of, of melanoma. Different study, um, different um, panel. This was actually a site of technology. The signal is not as strong, but there was still sort of a, a hint that these T cell population at baseline might, might be important for predicting response to anti-PD-1 to melanoma. 
so we actually applied these kinds of techniques to lots of different studies. There's another study that we worked on with a colleague of mine, uh, Martin Pillage at the Fred Hodge, where they, he was basically interested in looking at basic uh, at um, identifying tumor enriched immune alterations. And so he kept telling me when people look at these in solid tumors, they often you know find these signatures, but this has really this is really confounded by inflammation. So main driver of what you're seeing in cancer is also inflammation. So he wanted to do that study by looking at basically tumor biopsies and um, uh, donor match biopsies from healthy inflamed tissue. So we ran these kinds of technology. They had multiple high dimensional panels looking at T cells, antigen presenting cells. And what we found comparing this sort of, you know, um, healthy but inflamed tissue to the tumor tissue is that basically tumors was really, um, there was a a key T-reg populations that were highly enriched in these uh, tumor um, biopsies as opposed to the inflamed tissue. These T-regs actually co-express ICOS and HLDR positive for one or ICOS and HLDR negative for the other, which made us think that really ICOS was the main driver in these T-regs. Then they coupled that with single cell anti-seq and found that basically um, T-regs that co-express um, ICOS and R1 receptor 1 were really highly abundant in solid tumors. This was really specific, much higher than in the inflamed tissue and really much higher than in blood cancer. So this you know, led Martin and Steve think that maybe by targeting these T-regs in the tumor, you can maybe, um, you know, release that sort of escape mechanism and it's been working on by specific antibodies for that. So this is sort of a, just to show you that by using these computational techniques, we can go to, um, you know, and using sort of human samples through something that I like to call experimental medicine, we can identify uh, new mechanisms of, of um, escape for cancer and potentially new drugs. Okay, so I'll just touch on the last point here where what we're really interested in nowadays is spatial transcriptomics, which is basically not only looking at uh, the immune cells, but looking at the interaction of immune and cancer cells and map these interactions spatially. So this is actually one of the very old, um, early data sets we had generated. These, these are H and E staining. Actually, this is IHC where we're looking at the infiltration of T cells. This is to show you basically a tumor that we call hot, where you get really good infiltration of T cells on the left, and one where it's basically a cold tumor, you get very poor infiltration. So the question is what's different between these tumors? And also maybe within the, the, the cold tumor, how come you have some T cells that might be able to infiltrate and others don't, right? What's uh, phenotypically different between these two cells? population. And so we've been working very hard on using uh, spatial transcriptomics from uh, 10x technology. And these technologies actually uses these um, glass slides where you put a piece of of a tissue in it, and it's basically uh, printed with barcoded uh, probes that will capture the RNA. And these probes actually have a spatial barcode so they will tell you where the RNA is coming from. And so what happens here is that basically you can sort of map these probes spatially, right? So you will know that the RNA is coming from this spot or that spot or that spot. The key point is that this is not a single cell re- um, resolution because this is about 55 micron for a probe. And so 10X is about one to 10 cells. I think in reality, it's closer to 10 to 20 cells, but it's still pretty high resolution and it, al- it allows you to map the RNA spatially. But you don't get that beautiful pie, you get kind of a blurry version of the pie, right? And, and what we'd like to know is how can we get that blurry version of the pie to something that's higher resolution? And so for those of you who watch TV, you know, and, and you've watched CSI or, or any movies and you can see, you know, the, the face of the thief and you can't really see who it is, but all of a sudden they press on the button and they increase the resolution, you know who it is, right? Um, and this is kind of what we're trying to do. We're trying to use machine learning to improve the resolution so that we can map these cells as close to possible as single cell resolution. So this is a paper that we published here, and I'm just going to show you one example. So this is actually one of the, the early images that they had in that paper. This is actually an even earlier uh, version of the technology, which was called Spatial Transcriptomics at the time, which is actually a company that 10X Genomics has acquired and then turned that into the Vision platform. But basically, they were looking at a lymph node from a uh, patient with metastatic melanoma, and there's sort of different classes of uh, tissues or different parts of tissue that classified as melanoma, stroma, lymphoid tissue. They've done spatial transcriptomics doing clustering. 
And what you can see is that you get roughly the same pattern, but you're kind of missing the lean free structure around the melanoma here. We apply base space, just you know, plain vanilla uh, clustering without the enhancement of the resolution, and we get roughly the same answer. However, we can sort of you know, be a little bit more clever, and that's what we did in that paper. So instead of modeling the, the actual resolution of the data, so the spot, right, whether you're looking at sort of a, a lattice or a, um, sort of hexagon type um, structure, we kind of subdivide it. So we divide a square or we subdivide a hexagon into sub triangles, and then we're going to learn what's the contribution of each of these sub spots within the, the actual resolution and try to put it into a super resolution. So we can use basically an algorithm, um, sort of Bayesian framework, we can sort of estimate the contribution of each of these subspots towards the um, actual observed um, quantity of expression for each spot. So I'm not gonna go into the details and I'd be more than happy to talk to you if you have any questions, but basically by doing that, we can go to subspot resolution and you can see that now we can sort of get these sort of liquid um, structure around the cancer. So again, another example of using cutting edge machine learning tools, we can improve the, the um, data quality and what we can extract from the data. And this is something that I mentioned early, you know, this is actually um, a partnership that we have with Okin, who, um, which is a, a French sort of biotech or data science company, and they've been investing heavily in special transcriptomics and we're very excited to work with them in using these kinds of technologies. So I think I'm out of time. And so I'll just um, jump to this. And I want to thank you all for being here today, inviting me. Um, this is actually my old building when I was at the Fred Hatch in Seattle and all the, the collaborators that contributed to the work that I presented. And this is what we're building now in Lausanne, the interaction between the, the different centers that we have there, the hospital, the Ludwig um, Institute for Cancer Research, the university, and many of my collaborators that are either contributing to some of the work we'll be doing or help me through some of the slides here today. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, uh, Michael, for the very kind introduction. Hi, everyone, and good morning from my side as well. Um, the, so my presentation will be a bit different from the previous one. Uh, I'm uh, uh, showing you in terms of uh, you know, uh, IT ecosystem and digital platform what we are doing in Valgris at the Valgris University Hospital to allow and kind of support use cases as we saw this morning. So just a couple of words on, on the Paris University Hospital. We are placed at the Lang area, which is kind of 20 minutes in, in this direction, I believe. Uh, so the, this is called the healthcare cluster Lang. Uh, there are a lot of clinics. You see Paris Schultes Clinic, uh, Children University Hospital is coming there, and the Psychiatric University Hospital is also there. So also as university uh, ecosystem is very active in, uh, in healthcare. So we are specialized on um, musculoskeletal patient, orthopedic, paraplegiology, and uh, we, uh, as Michael mentioned, we are active in, the, in research, but also uh, innovation project. And, and of course, we are supporting the university in, uh, in uh, um, education of surgeon, orthopedic surgeon, uh, chiropractic, and, and, and so on. Um, so why we started in 1909 uh, as a sanatorium for physically disabled children uh, already in the, in the length. And now uh, we are working on the digitalization of the whole patient journey um, with digital twin, uh, with uh, monitoring of patients, but also intraoperative data, data collection. Two uh, Lighthouse project that uh, we had uh, and we are having in the last years. Uh, the first one was Surgeon. Uh, supported by the Hochschule Medizin Zurich, uh, surgeon enhancing technology. The outcome of this project was the world's first uh, holographically navigated spine surgery, where Professor Master Farshad used uh, uh, augmented reality glasses to actually uh, navigate the screw ins uh, insertion uh, in, uh, uh, for final sp uh, uh, fusion spinal surgery. And uh, on the other end, uh, we are working on uh, the uh, robotic navigation part, uh, intraoperative uh, robotic navigation to optimize the interface between surgeons and uh, robotic system. This is an uh, ongoing horizontal uh, uh, project, Pharos. And uh, as uh, 
we saw in this in this project and we we, we saw also this morning with the use cases all these uh, activities are generating a lot of data that are not kind of let's say normal clinical data set and uh, so to align with the past uh, effort of Palgris, where we really try to you know um, update uh, and uh, enhance our hospital information system with clinical data uh, you know, demographic of the patient medication uh, and also the medical image part like MRE, CT and, and so on. We are now working on an additional data set so that we are able to store uh, uh, also the data generated by this kind of uh, research, uh, research project and research activity also in a um, in a patient-centric way at the clinic level. So not just uh, in, a, in, a, in a research uh, environment, but really close with the other clinical clinical IT system. So that's the goal of a health data repository, being able to uh, store um, additional measurement. You can think about uh, augmented reality uh, images, uh, robotics, uh, uh, wearables is also, is also part of this, this uh, but also communication with patient questionnaire and all these kinds of data that uh, are currently not integrated in a normal hospital information system. So the, the goal of this is really improving our patient-centric view, but also the ability to query data, standardized data for, for research projects. And um, we, we saw in the you know, generation of these digital twins, uh, uh, working mostly on, on biomechanic and surgical planning, we use uh, clinical data, demographic information, medical images, of course, to create those digital twins that to put this data set together for machine learning segmentation we are from Bjorn uh, before, it's, uh, it's a lot of manual work. So first I will show you uh, uh, the, the idea and the research. Uh, we, we are doing one small use, cases, use case for uh, you know, the creation of digital twin. We use uh, medical images to segment, automatically segment vertebra or bones, for example, and with three-dimensional model, you can create either musculoskeletal model to look at muscle activity and a pre-operative status of the patient. And uh, going, going more, more into detail, we use uh, uh, finite element simulation to look at the biomechanics of, for example, a functional spine unit, a herniated or pathological uh, intravertebral disc, and those finite element biomechanical models are used to plan a surgical procedures. You can think about the screw insertion, optimize it in terms of bone quality within, within a vertebra. And those are those uh, uh, outcome or information that we extract from, from these uh, this digital, digital twins. But the, the creation and the, the use of this digital twin in a clinical setting is very, is very, is very difficult. Uh, also, if uh, we we were able to to validate certain at least certain part part of it, because in order to extract data from the different let's call it silos of the of the clinical environment, we use a lot of you know Excel table because you 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 select the patient from the clinical information system. You got the interesting patient for your. Uh, for your project, uh, and then you go into the image archives and you kind of extract and pre-process uh, the, the, the images uh, uh, for specific for a research project. On the other side, uh, research uh, is uh, uh, done a lot on, you know, uh, independent and kind of isolated infrastructure. Uh, also at Valgris, you know, we have Valgris researcher, we have ETH, we have University of Zurich, we have collaborators. Uh, and then, of course, you can create and train uh, your, your model, but um, the feedback on, at, at the patient level to the IT environment of the clinic is very, is very difficult and uh, sometimes non-existing, non also with very successful research projects. So what we are working on with, uh, uh, within this, uh, this new digital medicine unit is to collect uh, uh, or connect this, uh, this system, uh, working with API, be able to query data from all the different system uh, um, and uh, really preparing the data set uh, that we need for research with a single interface from, from the clinicians with the whole uh, IT, IT environment. Um, we're working with APIs. Uh, there is a lot of, uh, you know, kind of uh, exchange uh, with the IT department of, of the clinic. But the goal is that uh, we are able to 
see uh, a comprehensive patient models. And uh, if you think uh, about, so the first thing, for example, very important for research, we were able to query data and filter for uh, consent, right? Uh, and with this, uh, we are able to prepare data set, uh, anonymize the data set, uh, depending on the ethical protocol, and prepare um, a study, a study data set. So uh, another important part, and this is also uh, with respect uh, to, to the loop platform, is that we are able to, you know, monitor with the patient ID on one side, uh, and we are implementing a master patient index where we can uh, link and track uh, the pseudo pseudo ID in the different in the different studies, so that we are able to to uh, you know follow where a patient is uh, is integrated in which study, um, if of course uh, the the ethical frameworks allows that it can be either with a pseudo ID or or. Uh, Anonymized, anonymized data set. But the, the good part is that because we we we, aim, we we are working to towards a digital platform on the research side, we have an overview on the on the research projects that are going on, on the patient where are involved in which study, and also of course on the whole data extraction, anonymization, and standardization procedures. Um, in terms of data standardization, we are using uh, uh, you know data standards uh, that uh, are also kind of uh, international standard. We're using fire resources for uh, um, clinical information, whereas for images, uh, as uh, as uh, usual, we use uh, we use Tycom repository. But these uh, these standards are really coming from the from the clinical part. So we are able to map uh, uh, the data from the different system above to this standard that then support uh, support uh, uh, the research. And uh, as, uh, as mentioned, we use then this platform to connect to the central loop uh, biomedical informatic platform, which aims to connect uh, um, uh, the different university hospital in Zurich on a central infrastructure. But uh, this, uh, this kind of intermediate step uh, as in the Balgris digital platform allows us to prepare the data set uh, for a better, you know, communication and 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 uh, feedback uh, with uh, with the central central infrastructure. And this is uh, this is for the for the research part. Of course, uh, the, the the end goal, the vision, should be the ability to integrate uh, the outcome of successful research project back at the top level. So. At the clinical, in the clinical ecosystem, and for this, uh, we are also working in parallel to this API. Or actually, we 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 have is, we had installed uh, an additional data repository, which is able to communicate with the with the other system via this uh, application programming interface, where we are able to uh, for certain certain uh, research project to integrate. Uh, the the outcome of this uh, of this uh, uh, data driven tools and application back uh, on a on a patient level. Uh, if you remember the presentation of uh, of Bjorn, Professor Bjorn Mense, he showed this kind of uh, vectors of uh, um, additional data extracted from uh, image image analysis. So the goal is uh, not just to have this vector, but to have this vector at the same level than other. Uh, clinical data to offer this information, this additional information to the clinicians, and and that's the idea of this uh, of this uh, uh, additional data repository. Yes. Another um, in infrastructure that uh, we we build is uh, the ORX, which is a translational center for for surgery. There is a research infrastructure, it's an open infrastructure, everybody can access it uh, to test uh, new and innovative uh, uh, intraoperative methods. You can think about navigation, about the, like the, the augmented reality glasses. Uh, the goal of this, uh, of this infrastructure is also to collect a lot of intraoperative data um, uh, from different sensors, from different devices. And, uh, and uh, the, the, the final goal is to be able to extract uh, methods that can be used uh, uh into in the clinic so i will just give you uh, a short overview that's how the, the infrastructure looks like we have a surgery room which is the central uh, research infrastructure and then there is a skill lab on the other side where you can um, teach uh, or do surgical courses 
um, and the, the two rooms can be con you know connected and be used as one. But the, the, the really the, the, the vision also here as uh, the wall for the whole patient journey is to you know to go towards the surgery of the future, which basically means that you are able to connect. Uh, and uh, and fuse different different data modalities uh, um, from pre preoperative, intraoperative, and then also follow up data set into into a single layer. And uh, and in Teorix, uh, we spoke about uh, you know infrastructure. Infrastructure is for sure a very a very important point, and uh, um, also you know financially demanding. But uh, uh, here. It, it looks a one-to-one -one copy of the surgical uh, of a surgical room of Palguist, but the IT infrastructure on top of it is uh, is uh, of course totally different than than a normal one. Uh, but this uh, wall infrastructure with uh, you know computational resources, uh, which will will serve the wall the wall Palguist, and uh, will uh, also allows us uh, you know to better connect uh, and uh, to to central platform. And, uh, and perform certain use cases that uh, without infrastructure are, are very difficult. So we are working with NVIDIA uh, for uh, you know uh, synchronization of the different uh, of the different data of the different devices, uh, and um, the idea is um, to uh, fuse data also in terms of uh, of time uh, time synchronization. So the the goal uh, um, is to go from uh, um, this. Uh, uh, patient model, where uh, as uh, as uh, shown at the beginning, this API layer is able to, you know, collect uh, all the different clinical data and present them as a comprehensive overview to uh, a surgeons to something more, uh, you know, upgraded as an enhanced patient model, where we are able to integrate. Uh, you know the outcome of biomechanical simulation, uh, digital twin, a surgical planning, intraoperative data that we collect uh, with um, um, with different devices as uh, Hololens robots and so on, and this should be visible to the physicians on uh, on uh, the um, on the clinic IT environment. So we we are. The vision is that all the different projects that we have uh, along uh, the whole patient journey uh, are, are generating data sets uh, that are really important and relevant uh, for both research, but also for the clinic. And so we should be ready to integrate this, uh, um, this new data and uh, new uh, you know, insight uh, into, uh, into a patient journey into the clinical IT environment, but also then with the connection to other initiatives, be able to, to share and work on such a platform um, together, basically. And uh, with, uh, with this, uh, I'm at the end of, of my presentation. I will just point to you the summer school that we are doing this summer, uh, a med medical augmented reality summer school. Uh, it's, a, it's a, the third time we are doing it, and if you are, you know, a clinician interested in medical or or also developer in medical augmented reality, please uh, uh, contact us. Um, thanks a lot for your attention, and I'm happy to have your question. Thanks for the invitation and uh, the opportunity to present our work. Um, just up front, I already apologize for my voice. It's not 100 um, percent. But let's uh, get get going. So the the title of of my talk, the official title, is is rather longish. Um, the, the the title could also be machine learning and translational single cell biology, a little bit shorter, um, and uh, um, all the different uh, machine learning uh, jargon uh, terms that appear in the longish title will hopefully make more sense after having heard my presentation. In my lab, uh, we are very excited uh, about uh, the developments of high dimensional single cell technology. Uh, so today it is becoming easier and easier, uh, more and more routine uh, to uh, take tissues or cell suspensions um, and measure all kinds of different aspects um, 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 of the molecular makeup of these cells. Um, so today it is easy to do single cell sequencing. You just go to a facility and get your single cell transcriptomes. Flow and mass cytometry have developed uh, tremendously, allowing us to measure dozens of proteins at the single cell level. 
Um, and then all these imaging approaches uh, uh, that, that have been uh, developed over the last years now allow us to get this high dimensional molecular data um, with um, spatial resolution. Um, and um, I think I'm preaching to the choir, um, but uh, oftentimes the excitement about these types of, of data is, is tremendous because you think if you have measured all of this, you are already there uh, and have answered all the questions that you need. Uh, for instance, uh, trying to figure out how uh, the, 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 the single cell data uh, explains macroscopic phenotypes like survival or so. Um, um, but that is obviously not the case. Um, the step from this very information rich single cell data to the explanation of these macroscopic phenotypes requires uh, some, some sort of automatic interpretation step in between uh, by, by resorting to machine learning techniques. And in my lab, uh, we are developing these kinds of machine learning techniques to, to bridge this gap between the informative data and the interesting phenotypes that we want to explain. And roughly speaking, the type of techniques that we develop can be dissected into three different types. Um, the first type uh, I would coin comparative single cell data analysis that we consider situations where uh, uh, we, we perform studies where we um, uh, measure single cell uh, data of individual patients under different conditions and try to figure out what's the difference across the different conditions. Um, and this part um, of our research dovetails quite nicely with what uh, Rafael Gotardo uh, uh, presented before very impressively. Um, and then the second uh, uh, part of, uh, of, of our method development relates to translating methodology uh, for single cell data, more precisely suspension single cell data, um, to making sense out of spatial single cell data. Um, and then the last uh, part of methodological development deals with um, um, uh, reconstructing cellular dynamics using single cell RNA sequencing data mostly. Um, because as you will see uh, later on, single cell RNA sequencing data has a few peculiar properties that make uh, uh, this type of data amenable to do this uh, quite effectively. All right, um, so, so first I'm going to uh, um, uh, present you an old hat, a method that we have developed a while ago uh, to do comparative single cell data analysis and then show you how you can neatly use these ideas in order to make sense out, out of spatial single cell data. And then later on I will switch gears and tell you how you can reconstruct dynamics from uh, single cell RNA sequencing data. Um, so one major challenge when uh, dealing with uh, uh, any kind of high dimensional single cell data is the fact that it is high dimensional. And one way to think about this as a data scientist uh, that is oftentimes helpful is, is a geometric type of, of thinking about this data. Um, so every single cell that we measure, uh, we measure um, hundreds or thousands of different parameters for every single cell. And you can think about a single cell data set as a, a point cloud in this high dimensional space where every single parameter that you measure corresponds to one of the, um, param um, uh, one of the parameters that, that you measure. And cell types then uh, correspond to regions in this expression space that are populated or not populated. Um, and one way to take advantage of this geometric int intuition in order to visualize the data and the human scientist to look at the data, uh, the single cell data and, and make sense out of this uh, is by resorting to dimensionality reduction techniques. And every uh, uh, high profile paper that you see nowadays always uh, uh, comprises these uh, uh, nice uh, psychedelic uh, projections um, that, that allow you to, to um, uh, appreciate uh, clusters of cells, uh, clusters of phenotypes, and so on. Um, and one, although I mean, although these types of techniques are very helpful to, to get an initial overview, um, what, what these types of techniques, because they are unsupervised, um, as you will see in a second, um, make, make difficult is to do this comparative analysis. Um, so if you perform a single cell measurement in condition A, and in condition B, um, it is difficult to identify what are the relevant differences uh, across these different conditions. And I will briefly try to illustrate this um, uh, with this set of cartoons. Um, 
And again, this dovetails quite nicely uh, with the challenges that, that Raphael uh, before presented in making these kind of comparative analyses, for instance, figuring out what is the difference uh, between patients that respond to a therapy or not at the single cell level. So here uh, you see a cartoon of a projection of single cell data um, of patients that, for instance, are healthy and patients that are diseased. And now the question is, what is characteristic about the diseased patients? Um, and, um, and specifically, what kind of cell state or cell type is, is, is more frequent or less frequent in the disease condition? Um, and one way to figure this out is to take the single cell data, cluster it in an unsupervised fashion, um, and then basically assess the frequency uh, of cells in each of the clusters that we have identified. And then you see that in this cluster here, we have a significantly higher frequency of cells in the disease condition, and we can then conclude that these cells are important to explain the disease phenotype. Now it turns out that in practice, uh, things are a little bit more subtle, and that the cells that are relevant for the disease phenotype are first of all, or possibly rare, and possibly uh, similar to cells in the reference condition. And if we now apply this uh, approach of first clustering the data and then assessing frequency differences, we see that um, uh, the, the, the frequencies are not significantly different. Excuse me. Um, and, and this is basically this challenge that uh, uh, Raphael before presented, uh, that the a priori definition gating of cell types uh, might sometimes preclude identifying the relevant uh, cell states uh, to explain the disease phenotype. And, and so what we would like to do is to come up with a cell type definition or a gate uh, that takes into account the origin of the data um, uh, with respect to the uh, disease condition that we are interested in. So in, in, in machine learning terms, we want to um, inject supervised information in order to define cell types. And so how can we do this? We have resorted uh, to convolutional neural networks to do this. And um, convolutional neural networks uh, have been very successful, uh, as, as Bjorn Menze this morning presented uh, before, uh, in order to uh, analyze image data. Um, and for instance, to classify the presence of certain objects and images. And these convolutional neural networks operate on the basis of defining, uh, of evaluating primitive patterns in uh, small image patches, and then integrating this information across multiple layers of the model in order to come up with a, with a classifier, for instance. And now the idea is to uh, transfer this idea of a confnet uh, to single cell data uh, in terms of convolving over single cells instead of image patches and images. And so the simple model that we came up with, the cell CNN model, is a one layer uh, convolutional neural network that allows you to, to do exactly that. And so I will briefly uh, walk you through uh, the, the, the workings of this very simple model. Um, so you start off with a multi cell input. So, so that is a subset of a single cell measurement. 100 cells that we have measured using flow cytometry, for instance. And for each of the cells that, that, we, uh, that, that we have measured, we have measured a few different parameters, um, different protein, uh, um, protein levels. Um, and now the whole model consists of a convolutional layer, a pooling layer, and an output layer that then is used in order to predict the phenotype of the input uh, sample. And this phenotype can be diseased or healthy, uh, whatever phenotype you're interested in. And now, if you look at this convolutional layer, this convolutional layer is um, constructed out of different filters. And you can think about these filters as being, um, as being, as being um, definitions of relevant cell types uh, by virtue of putting importance to different protein parameters that you have measured. Um, and now if you apply a filter to a cell profile, then this filter will give a high score if the respective cell profile looks like the type of cell uh, that, um, uh, that, that this filter encodes. And, and then you do this for every single filter and every single cell. Um, and then in the pooling layer of this confnet, um, you basically go ahead and report something like the average or the maximum uh, output value of a filter. 
And this is an awkward way of counting how many cells of a certain type encoded by a respective filter are present in the multi-cell input. <clears throat> and then with the output of the pooling layer, this awkward way of, of evaluating frequency of cell types, <clears throat> we can then feed a classifier that then is trained to classify the field types. And now you might say, ah, this is not different to this um, simple approach of first clustering and then evaluating frequency. But the difference is that the parameters of the filters and, and the definition of the cell types that we uh, evaluate the frequency for is not predefined. Um, so this, these filters are trained while training the classifier. And this allows us to identify possibly novel cell subsets that nobody has appreciated before. And together with Burkhard Becher, fellow colleague here in Zurich, uh, we demonstrated the uh, capability of this approach by trying to classify uh, uh, multiple sclerosis patients with respect to a reference cohort of patients on the basis of evaluating cell profiles in the blood, in PBMCs. And so what Burkhardt's lab did is to perform site of mass cytometry measurements of these PBMCs. And then when applying uh, the cell CNN model to this data, uh, the model identifies a cell subset that is more frequent in the diseased cohort. And now if you look at the TSNI projection of this uh, mass cytometry data and you um, highlight the cells that the model has discovered, then you see that these cells form this, this cluster up here. And now the beauty uh, of this simple model is that it is easy to interpret. So now we can go back and ask what kind of cells did the model select and ask what kind of molecular properties do these cells have. And so here you see histograms of the marker profiles of all cells in the data set and in pink the histograms uh, respectively for the cells selected by the model. And without going into too much detail here, um, the model found a T helper cell subset that had a so far unappreciated uh, cytokine profile, uh, including GMCSF, making Boca very happy. No pun intended. Um, so in a follow-up study, uh, we investigated the impact of um, the treatment of multiple sclerosis patients um, with, with uh, dimethylfumarat. Um, and, uh, and there, the, we, we, we found that after treatment, after one year, the types of cells in the PBMCs that reduce in frequency were exactly the type of cell that we identified before uh, in this discovery study. All right, and with this um, uh, uh, presentation of the old hat, uh, now, now let's go and see how we can apply these ideas in order to make sense out of spatial single cell data. So here um, I'm, 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 uh, um, I'm telling you about a collaboration with Benjamin Ruf and Tim Greten uh, from the NIH where the, the application context was to get a better understanding of uh, liver cancer, of HCC. And amongst other things, uh, what uh, the Greten group did um, is to perform codex measurements of uh, liver tissue biopsies. So codex is a, a spatial proteomic technique um, that I guess here in Zurich, a lot of people are familiar with imaging mass cytometry that is very much related to imaging mass cytometry, but works um, um, on spatial profiling of uh, protein levels using a fluorescence marker approach. And so what this codex technology allowed us in this particular project is to evaluate 37 different protein markers on tissue slides um, and, and evaluate the distribution of these 37 protein markers uh, um, in, in a spatial manner. And so here on the right hand side, you see an example of such a codex image highlighting um, a few of the 37 different markers that we measured. Mm, and uh, on this slide, you can see um, 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 uh, an image of the healthy tissue, of the tumor tissue, and the rim tissue that surrounds the, the liver cancer tumor. And the, the initial uh, goal or the initial question that we had uh, when um, acquiring this data was to get a better understanding of a specific immune cell type in the context of liver cancer. And that are uh, these MAID cells, these bucosa associated invariant T cells. So this is a specific type of T cell that is able to detect metabolites 
um, in, in, in other cells. And these mates in the context of HCC have been reported to be associated with the survival of, of HCC patients. And in the literature, there was controversial information about whether um, having these mates present at a higher level um, in, in the liver is either beneficial or not beneficial uh, for the um, progression of, uh, of liver cancer. Um, and so uh, here we wanted to investigate whether possibly the context in which these mate cells operate has uh, explains this, this discrepancy, this controversy. And in order to do this, uh, we realized that the, that the like, first problem that we have to solve is very similar to the problem that we solved uh, in this MS application that I showed you before, where we had suspension-based single cell data. So basically what we want to understand how the cell type composition around these made cells is different in healthy tissue and tumor tissue, and for that matter, also in the rim tissue. So we again have this comparative single cell uh, analysis uh, setup. Um, and one simple approach that one could apply in order to, to, to figure out these differences is uh, to conceive these uh, multiplex proteomic imaging uh, data as images and throw confidence at it and classify. The issue with these types of studies oftentimes is that you don't have millions of images, but you only have a small number of images. So in, in, in this particular case, uh, we had... Uh, we had uh, uh, almost 40 patients only uh, in, in this study um, for which we get this imaging data. So we thought that we have to inject some prior knowledge in order to get more informative data. And the idea here is uh, that we know that the images are images of tissue. We know that the atomic, uh, uh, the, the, the atomic uh, um, uh, element of, of a tissue is, is a cell. Um, and that uh, we can use cell segmentation in order to transform uh, these uh, images, these uh, images with 37 colors, into these uh, um, segmented uh, cell images. And now uh, we, we, can, we can reduce this comparative problem uh, to a problem that is very similar to the one that we considered before. Again, we want to know how the cell type composition, the context in which these made cells operate, in, 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 in healthy tissue and the disease tissue is different. And one approach that one could perform is to go ahead and take the data, a priori defined cell types of the cells uh, that have been measured, and then simply count uh, the frequency, evaluate the frequency of the different cell types in the neighborhoods of these made cells. And then just evaluate whether you have significant differences. But the problem with this approach is exactly the one that I showed you before. Um, if, if the relevant cells uh, are, are somewhat not well captured by the a priori definition of, of the cell types, then this classification will, will show a negative result. So what we would like to do is to actually not having to uh, resort to a priori cell type definitions, but instead do a supervised analysis that directly takes as input this uh, um, uh, uh, processed spatial data in order to define in a data-driven fashion the cell subset whose frequency turns out to be significantly different across the conditions. And so that's basically, again, a cell CNN analysis. So we, here we have our tissue image. Here we have an abstraction of the tissue image. So here we have the different tissue types. And in blue, in this cartoon, I have highlighted this, this cartoon made cells, and, 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 the, and the cells around these made cells are, are, are the red cells here. And now the question is, how are these groups of cells uh, that are either in the normal or in the rim or in the tumor tissue uh, different in terms of cell type composition? And that's basically the same type of problem that we have been talking about before. We can just plug it into our cell CNN model, roughly speaking, and get a result. And so in this particular study, um, we found that um, there is a specific type of cell or group of cells that is more frequent um, in the, in the, in the non-tumor tissue. And if you now go back and try to explain what kind of cells these are, you can resort to, up to, to cell type annotations that we also had at hand, and then uh, figure out that the type of cell that is overrepresented and discovered by the model um, is, is, a, is a particular type of macrophage, an M2 macrophage that is PDL1 positive.
Um, and, and that was something that uh, uh, excited our collaborators quite a bit because this motivated a potential mechanism of how the mate activity uh, might be uh, might be might be perturbed across the different tissue types, and that is via this PD1 PDL1 axis. Um, and uh, yeah, so this this is uh, just a slide um, where uh, I, I wanted to to mention that. Um, um, the issue with these computational approaches oftentimes is that you always get a result and it's quite difficult to validate whether uh, this result is actually real. And, 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 and that is um, not so much an issue if you have this imaging data because uh, once you have identified a specific cell subset that you can pin down by virtue of a molecular profile, you can, you can map it to the image and you can map it to the proximity of the main cells that you are interested in and you can evaluate whether uh, the pattern that the machine learning model identified uh, actually looks biologically sensible. And this is something that we could do here and, and, and see that uh, around the mates, uh, these M2 macrophages, PGL1 positive M2 macrophages, indeed uh, were, were close to, to these mates. And again, um, this finding um, actually induced uh, these mechanistic hypotheses, um, and I'm just showing one of the many validation experiments in the mouse model uh, that our collaborator did, um, investigating uh, whether, uh, whether the, these, these, these M2 macrophages, for instance, are important. Um, and so in this experiment, um, our collaborator, Benny, uh, he considered a mouse model that was depleted of M2 macrophages and then evaluated what happened. Um, to the mates um, and, uh, for instance, found that uh, the mates in the absence of these M2 macrophages invaded the tumor much more strongly, infiltrated the tumor much more strongly, and that the mates uh, also exhibited a stronger effector function, uh, as highlighted by higher granzyme B and interferon gamma levels. And again, uh, uh, Benny did a, a lot more other experiments perturbing the axis, evaluating the tumor growth in the mouse models uh, and, 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 and showing that this finding uh, uh, from the analysis of the codex data uh, actually uh, seemed to be, uh, seemed to make mechanistic sense. All right. Um, with this, I'm switching gears to the, to the third vignette um, to um, how to reconstruct um, cellular dynamics from, in this case, single cell RNA sequencing data. And this is a project that also uh, started here uh, in, in Zurich uh, in collaboration with Aneta Oxenius uh, in the biology department at ETH. And, and there, uh, the question that we had is um, how do CDA T cells in chronic infections develop uh, the exhaustion uh, phenotype? Um, and um, and the, the, the model, the context in which we studied this was in the mouse and uh, uh, in, in using the lymphocytic uh, choriomeningitis virus model, um, uh, where you have uh, the possibility to induce chronic infections uh, versus acute infections. Um, and the challenge of, of studying this process in detail, um, on the one hand, is that this is a process that develops over time. It's like in the mouse model, it develops over, over multiple weeks. Uh, so we, we, we have to uh, resort to a time series setup to study this process. This process is multifactorial, so it just does, does not only involve your favorite gene, but it, it uh, possibly or probably, yeah, we know it involves quite, quite many genes, quite many players. And then another issue that, uh, as you will see in a second, actually will come to our advantage is the fact that this process is asynchronous. Um, so, so when you infect the mouse with the virus, it's, it's not the case that every single T cell sees the virus at the same time, but, but that you, have, you have different delays. So the data that uh, you, you acquire is somehow blurred by this asynchrony. And so the bottom line is, in order to address all of these challenges, you would like to perform a single cell time series experiment to study this, this process. This is what we did. Uh, so in the mouse model, we induced a chronic infection. Um, and, and then across eight different time points in the course of three weeks, uh, we evaluated single cell transcriptomes um, of splenic CDA T cells. And so here specifically, we used uh, uh, a transgenic uh, a CDA T cell that expresses um, uh, each of which uh, expresses the same uh, T cell receptor. Um, all right. Um, and so here you see uh, the results of the single cell RNA sequencing experiment for an acute infection. Um, 
you see a T state projection of the single cell RNA sequencing data. Um, and each of these dots again corresponds to a cell that we measure and the respective uh, 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 expression profile. And uh, on the basis of these uh, um, expression profiles and hallmark genes, we can figure that up here we have the naive CDA T cells, down here we have the effector T cells, and down here we have uh, the, the memory T cells. And now one question that uh, you could ask um, is how do the naive CDA T cells become effector or memory cells? And, and how, 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 how well can you answer this question only using the single cell RNA sequencing data? Um, and um, for instance, if you um, want to do it in a hypothesis driven way, you can uh, hypothesize that you have a linear um, uh, development of naive into effector into memory cell, or uh, maybe you have this developmental uh, um, uh, model that um, uh, would uh, involve a bifurcation where cells decide to become either effector and memory at some point. Um, and in single cell RNA sequencing analysis, you have all these trajectory inference approaches um, that you could use to uh, answer this question, but oftentimes the data is too blurred, is too ambiguous in order to, to make this distinction clearly. And now it turns out that for single cell RNA sequencing data, um, we actually do not only measure the expression profile of only fully spliced mRNA, but we also measure uh, the profiles of partially spliced mRNA. Um, and, and, and this additional uh, profile of partially spliced mRNA um, allows us to uh, not only make a statement about the state of the cell right now, but about the state of the cell in a few hours from now, when the partially spliced mRNA is fully spliced and so on. Um, and, and, and this is particularly relevant if the cell is, is about to change its state. Um, and, and basically what this type of information allows you uh, with uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, more mass is to assign a velocity to a cell that indicates how the cell moves in expression space. Um, and now if you do this uh, velocity analysis for the acute infection data, uh, you quite nicely see the flow of, uh, of, of, of states in this data, um, and you see that uh, you seem to have this, this, uh, yeah, this bifurcation point down here, uh, making this uh, a second model for the development um, more, more likely. And here you see the data uh, uh, overlaid of the chronic infection and the acute infection. You see the velocity field uh, from the RNA velocity analysis, and also, again, you see this, uh, this, this region of, of bifurcation here. Um, and in this data, uh, besides these uh, states that we already, uh, that I highlighted before, the memory, the effector state for the uh, chronic infection uh, data, we also have a memory-like uh, end state, and we have this exhaustion state that we want to better understand. And now the question is, how can we use this velocity information to, um, to, to understand how the naive CDA T cells uh, become exhausted or become memory or memory-like? And now, um, glossing over uh, quite a few details, you can, you, can, you can transform this velocity field, or you can think about this velocity field like a force field in this expression space um, that you can then uh, use to define a Markov chain, which you can then in turn use to, well, to sample from the Markov chain, to simulate the dynamic behavior of the cells in the expression space. And this Markov chain allows you to produce these, these nice uh, cartoons, these nice movies, where you can actually watch how the cells uh, from the start state develop into these absorbing end states. Um, and in order to, to, to learn something from, from, from these simulations, um, you can now go ahead and take all of these or, yeah, these, these, these many simulations, these many Markov chain samples that you generate uh, in order to, to come up with consensus trajectories indicating the major routes uh, of how cells get from A to B. Uh, and for instance, for the chronic infection data, um, if you uh, investigate how do samples, Markov chain samples from the initial state to the memory-like end state or respectively to the exhaustion uh, end state look like, you see that um, these trajectories that, that, you, that you can infer uh, have a shared path up to a certain point and then bifurcate. And you can then investigate these trajectories with respect to uh, which genes change along these trajectories and also figure out which of the genes show differential expression in a temporal manner. Um, and so here I only highlight 
uh, genes that are well known to be associated with uh, developing exhaustion or developing memory-like state. And what you can also do now is on the basis of these simulations, uh, make predictions about which genes at an early state are predictive about the fate of the cells. Um, and, um, and, and, and then you, you can also do this analysis uh, uh, focusing only on genes or proteins for which you can do validation experiments. Um, and so here, for instance, uh, we identified that uh, CXCR6 uh, and TCF1 turned out to be predictive for developing T-cell exhaustion fate. And now um, performing adoptive transfer experiments where after five days of infection, isolating cells, sorting with respect to these markers, and then retransferring these cells into an uh, infection-matched host, uh, evaluating what the fate of, of, these, of these transferred cells uh, is after, 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 after more time, after 12 days. And so what you can see is that uh, cells that were predicted to become exhausted uh, all became exhausted uh, um, after, after some time. Um, and, and those cells that were predicted to, be, uh, to become memory-like, um, to a certain extent, became memory-like. But also to a certain, or like to actually to a larger extent, uh, we're, we're found to have this exhaustion phenotype in the end. Um, and so, at the first glance, this was a little bit disappointing, uh, uh, somewhat not matching our at least naive uh, prediction. Um, but yeah, if you go through the literature and if you know the exhaustion field a little bit, uh, you know that uh, um, these, these memory like. Uh, um, uh, T cells are known to to replenish the pool of exhausted T cells, um, and and so therefore this finding did not contradict the predictions that, that we made. Oh, yeah. All right, um, and then I mean to to wrap up quickly. Um, this method that we have developed, the simulation-based method to to, 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 uh, um, uh, uh, to infer these trajectories, um, you, you, can, you, can, you can evaluate whether you can use this, um, uh, this method in order to also uh, derive trajectories that have different topologies. So um, we just evaluated this uh, bifurcated case, uh, but the question is, can you also um, infer um, circular topologies? And uh, can you also evaluate like uh, mixed topologies where you have uh, circular processes uh, uh, interlaced with uh, bifurcated processes? And um, we have shown all of this in a paper that uh, very recently appeared. And uh, in the interest of time, I only show wanted to show you one vignette uh, about um, analyzing a single cell RNA sequencing data of the cell cycle. Um, so here on the left-hand side, uh, you see the velocity field, the stream plot of, of this uh, uh, cell cycle data. And here you see the trajectory that uh, our uh, approach cytopath learns. And what you can see is that um, the, the trajectory in, in, indeed turns out to be circular and also allows uh, for the cells to exit into this uh, G1 checkpoint state uh, that, that is the precursor of the G0 state. And if you apply approaches for trajectory inference that don't take advantage of the velocity information, uh, then, then you see that uh, um, these, these models have a hard time to, to actually identify the circular topology and in particular also to um, uh, identify this, this potential exit into this G1 checkpoint state. Um, and what, what, what this velocity-based uh, approach also allows uh, to do is to identify two groups of cells in this um, G1 state here um, that uh, turn out to have different indicative marker levels indicating either their progression into the cell cycle or the exit of the cell cycle. And with this, I'm at the end. Um, so I uh, briefly presented you how uh, uh, the methods that we developed to do comparative single cell analysis the cell CNN model and the cell CNN model applied to spatial proteomic data. Uh, we talked about these applications uh, for this uh, uh, biomarker discovery in multiple sclerosis or identifying uh, the uh, made niche composition that is specific to different tissue types in liver cancer. Um, and, uh, and then uh, the last vignette was about reconstructing cellular dynamics using velocity information uh, by a simulation based approach. Uh, and its application uh, mostly to um, reconstruct T-cell exhaustion, development of T-cell exhaustion. And um, yeah, um, 
we, we, we hope uh, to see more of this single cell data analysis uh, to come into uh, translational and clinical research. In Tübingen, um, we are working on preliminary studies, for instance, to also acquire this type of single cell data in the context of molecular tumor boards, um, uh, hopefully allowing for uh, better uh, therapeutic decisions in these bodies. And with this, thanks to the people involved in funding. Happy to take questions. Thank, thank you for inviting me. It's really been a very interesting uh, conference so far, and I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I, I wanted to start just by like a, a little bit of background and evolution. Um, this historically is kind of what got my interest in this. This is a ductal carcinoma in situ. Uh, so it's a, it's a human specimen. And the staining, so, so this is tumor filling a duct. The basement membrane is around the edge here. Right, right in here, well, right there. And it's being stained, and it's stained for GLUT1. So this is glu 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 a glucose transporter um, uh, protein. And what you can see is that there is a clear uh, gradient in the expression as you go from the edge of the tumor in. And um, we thought about this for, for, for a while, and, and what, what this is is that the the blood vessels are, remain on the outer side of the basement membrane. And so this is a diffusion reaction uh, uh, process. The, the uh, oxygen uh, diffuses into the duct from the outside. And as, it's, as it diffuses, it's being uh, taken up by the cells. And so it's, its concentration goes down as you go along the, the radius. And you can see then that at, at, in response to that gradient of hypoxia, you see an upregulation of glucose transporters. Now, this is pretty obvious, but this is evolution. And I, I want to be clear that we, when we talk about evolution as a process of mutations, that's not incorrect, but it's not, in, it, but it's not complete. Um, uh, 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 all that um, uh, uh, Darwin wanted was a mechanism of inheritance. So that can be uh, genetic mutation, but it can, can also be epigenetic control. And in this case, it gives the cells, the cancer cells, a, um, a kind of a switch back and forth in, a, in an environment which can change, as you can see from here, this. Um, so again, as we think about this, it's, you know, I, I thought before this thought about cancer as like a ball of cells that just starts as a little ball and gets bigger and bigger. But in fact, it has a distinct geometry. It involves uh, interductal growth. Uh, there's distinctive uh, gradients that, that are generating this, this link between the environmental properties and the phenotypic and genetic properties of the cancer cell, I think is really key and, and something I'm going to really focus on here. So this is a famous article from the from New England Journal where they found that within renal cancers that you see genetically different populations all through the, the tumor, um, which which really surprised cancer biologists. And they call this clonal evolution because what they say is that you get these random mutations and some of them provide an increase in fitness and now those prop, uh, those grow and, and the results in the spatial uh, generation, uh, spatial variation. But I, but I want to, again, you know, uh, evolution is about births and deaths, um, and it's about how the local environment selects uh, and, and changes that birth and death rate, depending on the properties of the cells. And so this is the same breast cancer, um, but two different regions. We looked at, we're looking at KI-67, which is the, um, uh, the here, uh, generally um, a, 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 a method of... Um, of uh, measuring proliferations, caspase three is death, and then you see on either side, GUT one uh, uh, staining and carbonic anhydrase twelve staining, which are which are both uh, both factors in the environment. And you can see that within these different regions, there's a very different birth and death rate, and and also a different environment. It, it's selecting for specific. Um, uh, phenotypes, the phenotypes that are maximally fit within that distinct environment. So, um, what I would add to this branch of level evolution is the fact that blood flow varies considerably over these tumors, and that results in tremendous variations in microenvironmental uh, properties, and therefore different selection forces and different phenotypic adaptive strategies. And so, when we talk about it as purely mutational. Uh, process, we're really losing 
uh, a key part of the what's being selected, which is uh, the environmental properties. Now, when we throw in chemotherapy and other um, uh, things within the uh, within the environment, and we are selecting for that those properties as well. So I'm just a, a, a pop quiz. Um, I usually pick on a student here, but I, I can't really. As I get older, I can't tell the students from the young faculty. So I, and I've gotten in trouble doing that, so I won't uh, actually ask anybody. But these are dandelions. Dandelions are one of the rare multicellular species that, are, that uh, reproduce asexually. This is in a field. These are about 30 centimeters high. They give rise to about three flowers per year. Um, these are dandelions that you see on the lawn. On, at least I hope you see these on the, on the lawn in New York too. These are about, um, uh, the, 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 the actual plant is about one and a half centimeters high. And it gives rise to the seed pack about once a week. Now, we could do the genetics of this, right? What are the genetic differences between these? But we also just think about what are the um, what, what is the selection force and the phenotypic adaptation? Anybody want to? Yeah. So it's the lawnmower. Uh, this is so-called lawnmower. Um, it's it's low to keep its leaves from being damaged by the lawnmower's blades, and because at least in, in the U.S. most people mow their lawn once a week, uh, it's it's synchronized its seed pack to the, the lawn mowing. Um, the point is that, th would the genetics tell you that? And, and, I, and I think that, that you know, the genetics are very good. They tell you a lot of things, but it would be very hard from genetic information alone to infer the actual selection process and phenotypic adaptation. So I, I just wanna kind of keep that in mind. So from what I'll tell you after this, there's no genetics in this. This is really just, just really thinking entirely phenotypic level. So why do we need to know about cancer evolution? Well, this is um, an example of, of classic um, patient-specific oncology. This is a woman with um, metastatic lung cancer. She has an EGFR mutation. Uh, we can target that mutation, in this case with Erwania, but there are many other drugs now that are available, and you get a great response. This is classic sort of um, patient-specific oncology, very good example. The problem is what, what we sort of lose in that in that kind of paradigm is the next series of steps, which we continue to give erlotinib, and very quickly usually, but um, almost inevitably, the tumor progresses. It evolves resistance, and I would argue that these this the second half of the arc is also dependent on the patient, the the, the tumor, and and the treatment, and it also can be specific, and we can understand this. I think oncologists have tended to look at this holistically as it, it happens. Um, but, but the rest of the, my talk will be that I think we can uh, look at this, uh, we can in, intervene on it uh, to the patient's benefit. Um, the general principle is that resistant phenotypes are inevitable. Uh, you, you, you place tremendous selection forces on these cells, they're dying. Uh, they have the whole human genome uh, from which they can uh, develop phenotypic um, pro uh, properties that are resistant, and they have probably a vast array of potential strategies. So blocking one, which is what's been done in the past, probably does not get you anywhere. In fact, that, that's been the clinical observation that, that you, can, you can block one, but resistance still emerges because there are many alternatives. Um, but, uh, but we would argue that the mere presence of a small resistant population in itself is not clinically significant. But it becomes clinically significant when it proliferates sufficiently to become the one billion cells per centimeter that is now visible clinically. And that those population dynamics are governed by Darwinian dynamics. And, 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 and so the, the, the hypothesis here is you can intervene uh, by understanding those Darwinian dynamics uh, to, to at least to delay or prevent the proliferation. Um, so, um, evolution confers enormous advantages on cancer cells. They basically uh, can beat virtually any therapy that's that's given to them, and that's a that's a tremendous uh, advantage. And I, again, I'll, I'll I'll sort of beat this horse a little bit more. Uh, mechanisms of inheritance include mutations, epigenetic changes, as well as ecological niche construction. So angiogenesis, for example, is a niche construction pathway which can be inherited down generations, um, but 
Evolution also imposes constraints and limitations that can be exploited to optimize therapy. And this is really kind of what we'll talk about. When we think about cancer, therapy is a game. We can consider it as the oncologist plays the game by applying a therapy. And the cancer plays the game by a, uh, developing an adaptive strategy. So that's the game between the, the, the cancer treatment and the um, cancer itself. When you look at this as a game theoretic problem, the oncologist actually has two really big advantages. One is that he or she plays first. This is a stack over game or a leader follower game, meaning that the, that the cancer cannot play a, a counter move until the oncologist has played a treatment. Um, the other, and I think even bigger advantage is that the, is the oncologist is sentient, can play dynamically can anticipate responses, can change therapies uh, to, in, to anticipate the, uh, the, the, the moves of the, of the cancer cells. Um, on the other hand, the cancer population, like any evolving population, can only adapt to the here and now. It can never anticipate the future. It can never adapt to something it has not seen before. The problem, though, is that the, is that the oncology dogma right now is that you, you basically, any treatment is applied continuously at maximum tolerated dose until progression. And you'll notice by doing that, the, the oncologist loses both advantages, um, plays the same move over and over again. So the, the cancer simply has to respond in the same way. And typically the cancer therapy is not changed until the tumor has progressed. So the oncologist has now ceded control of the game to the tumor, the, the, the tumors, is, is leading the game and the oncologist is following. Now, if we reframe this idea uh, evolutionarily, let's assume we start with a, a population of cells, most of which are sensitive to the, to the therapy, and a couple, a few, are resistant either de novo or, or, or they can adapt quickly enough to become resistant before they're killed. And let's give maximum tolerated dose, as, as you can see here. Um, great response, terrific response, really. Um, this is, you know, celebrating uh, everybody. This is a great response. And what do you do? Well, you treat the same way. You just keep treating the same way. And essentially, the tumor now can respond the same way every time it will begin to proliferate. So even if you can't see it, even if you can't see these changes radiographically, in the background, the tumor population is growing. It's getting both larger and it's getting more homogeneous as it fills in different niches. <laughs> and doing this, um, then the, cancer, the, the, the oncologist does not change the game, does not change his or her move until the tumor is large. By now, um, it's, it's beyond the, the, uh, you know, the changing that they, it's, it's generally prepared uh, as sufficiently large and heterogeneous that it can respond successfully. <laughs> Adaptive therapy, and there's many ways to use evolution in this, but this is one way that we've uh, done that uses, uh, that's but gone into the clinic. And we start with the same mix of, 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 of phenotypes, sensitive or resistant, and we give treatment. Now, in this case, rather than giving the maximum possible dose, you give the minimum necessary, just enough to sort of knock the population down and explicitly uh, plan to leave behind a significant population of sensitive cells. You then stop there, it's gone. Now the tumor will grow back, but now it's growing back when there's no uh, selection for resistance. And because in general, these, the cells that are resistant have a molecular burden they, that in the, in the absence of therapy, whatever that molecular mechanism of resistance is, costs them something. And so in the absence of therapy, generally this, the, the uh, sensitive cells are fitter than the resistant cell. So when it, when it comes back, you more or less recapitulate the phenotypic distribution that you started with, and then you just do it again. Um, so here, rather than kind of a passive approach, the idea is that treatment is a forcing function. Um, you're, you're applying it as needed at the correct time. And the idea is to induce an oscillating near steady state. As long as you can continue the tumor going up and down, uh, you've, got to, the, you've got control. The first clinical trial on this was with abiraterone. Uh, this is for metastatic uh, prostate cancer. 
Initially, it's treated with androgen deprivation therapy, basically you turn off the testosterone production in the body. Um, you almost always get a tremendous response, but it never is curative. The tumor always comes back. In, in about two thirds of men, the, the tumor actually begins to make its own testosterone and, and just kind of spill it into the environment. And it, it therefore is, is essentially producing uh, its own growth factor. Um, abiraterone blocks the enzyme that makes testosterone and so it blocks this pathway. And it's the second line therapy for cancer uh, resistant prostate cancer, typically responses in the range of eight to 16 months. We began by developing a math model. Um, we basically simply define the subpopulations based on their interaction with testosterone. And, and I just, uh, I'll anticipate questions. Yes, there are many more complex and detailed ways that we could do this. But our goal here was to do the simplest model possible. And also, if there, if there are potential um, uh, uh, other things that are involved, if we can't measure them, it's pointless to put it into the, to the, um, to, to the model. So we basically have the T plus cells, which are, that require exogenous testosterone. These are the dominant populations. Usually when prostate cancer uh, presents, these are castrate sensitive cells. The TP cells produce testosterone, and so they, they are the target of the abiraterone. You'll notice that there's a, a complex dynamic here because these cells spill the, the, the um, testosterone into the environment, and so the T plus cells can actually benefit from this uh, secondarily, and uh, those are called cheaters. In other words, they're benefiting from a public good being made by the TP cells, but not paying for the cost, which... which I think is probably a factor in some of these dynamics. And then the T minus cells are the ones that are in the, that can proliferate independent of testosterone, and they're they're the bad guys. They're the ones we're going to try to suppress. Um, we develop first the model, and then we have a, this this payoff matrix for the gain between the the oncologist and the uh, cancer. Dr. Jin Tong Zhang was the brave oncologist who uh, who did this. Uh, basically, it was very simple. We give abiraterone. It, once the PSA falls below 50% of pretreatment value, we stop, uh, and we don't uh, we don't start therapy again until the uh, PSA has gone back to the original um, value. We did simulations to predict this. It predicted we could control the tumor for two to 20 cycles, um, which a, a, a prediction which turned out to be wrong, and I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Um, this is the this is the group we had we had 70 patients being treated with adaptive therapy. 16 were uh, eligible for the for the, the trial, meaning that they fulfilled all uh, criteria and got a greater than 50 percent decline of PSA with the initial abiraterone um, administration. But then were treated with standard of care, which is continued with maximum tolerated dose. <clears throat> um, time to progression, uh, you can see here, was increased by about 19 months. We've now gotten to the medium overall survival, uh, which increased um, uh, o over uh, two years compared to the uh, standard of care. Because the patients were not being treated about half the time, no, it was half the time where they were, the therapy was withdrawn, they received only about half the dose of abiraterone that they would have received otherwise. Um, abiraterone is quite expensive, and so the... Uh, Reduction in cost was about seventy thousand dollars per patient per year, and that was it was that was an analysis done by some economists. There was a a, a part of this which did not fulfill predictions, and I said that we we thought that we could only keep the uh, cycles going for, for at most twenty. And we now have four patients uh, who continue to be uh, cycling on therapy stably for seven years. Um, so there's this very long tail on a curve which we did not expect to happen. And um, th 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 this kind of brings a point here, and that is that um, m most clinical trials um, where they, let's say, compare uh, uh, treatment A against treatment B, uh, are, are the, the, the gold standard is sort of randomized, double-blind uh, study. At the end of it, you get the statistical statement that A is better than B. For example, what we don't ask or answer in most of these clinical trials is why. Why is A better than B? And so here, what we wanted to do was take the mathematical model 
that we used to design the trial use longitudinal data from the trial to update the parameters to check whether our pretreatment parameter values were correct, and then use that, uh, that updated model to um, examine every patient in the trial to understand what happened to that patient. Um, so this is part of that process, but this is where we, we, we did well, except for this. Um, a key part of this is the relative fitness of the sensitive cell over the resistant cell. You remember that that, that is what controlled the, the population that, that arose after a cycle. Um, if, the, if the sensitive cell was considerably more uh, 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 fit than the resistant cell in the absence of treatment, then that's the greater suppression of that population. Uh, what we measured from the trial data was that this value is about seven. What we had anticipated pretreatment simulations was just about two or three. So there's a, about a two-fold difference. This nerdy thing turns out to be actually a, an, an interesting and important factor, and, and, and this is why. If you just look at the lower left, the blue line is the sensitive population as it goes down uh, when we treat and then goes up after we stop treatment. When it goes down, the resistant population jumps up a little bit because uh, it's no longer being suppressed by the, the, the sensitive population. When the tumor, uh, when the sensitive population goes up and we stop therapy, the math model predicted it would stabilize, the, the resistant population would essentially plateau. And so you see that over cycles, what, you, what, you, what we had predicted was you could up plateau, up plateau, up plateau, which is why we felt there was always gonna be an upper limit of the um, cycles that we could maintain. If you have a, a ratio of six, then the right uh, model uh, the simulation holds. And now instead of, uh, when, so when the sensitive population goes up, instead of a plateau, it actually pushes the, the resistant population down because it has greater fitness benefit than we expected. In this case, what the model predicts is that under certain circumstances, if you can optimize this, you can actually push the resistant population to somewhere close to uh, extinction. So now, as I said, we can, we can look at these cases and see whether that was the case. And you, this is one of the patients who's still, uh, he's now seven years out. And it, what the model predicted, what the model showed was that very early on, um, we hit a perfect set of two or three cycles which caused the resistant population to decline somewhere close to zero. Now you can see that we didn't hit perfect cycles after that, but the population of resistant cells is so small that it does not appear to be important. Um, and so it was these kind of perfect cycles that, that according to our model simulations allowed this, this observed um, factor, something that we had not anticipated. We've looked in these patients, the four that are, uh, that are still cycling, um, we've looked for DNA markers and they are uh, not, we don't see them. The other thing is that you'll notice that in the top row, the actual uh, uh, lowest point of each cycle stays about the same. And one of the things that we learned was that as the resistant population goes up, that, that, that trough gets higher and higher. And you see there's, so far we see no evidence for that. So it's possible we have greatly reduced the population um, to somewhere near extinction levels. Now, then the question is, why did we fail? And again, the model sh showed us that we made a mistake. Um, we, the, the, what, the way we wrote the, the protocol was that the PSA had to go below 50% to stop therapy, but that had to be confirmed by a radiographic study. We got the PSA values every four weeks but we could only get the imaging studies because of insurance issues every four months. And as a result, what would happen is, as you can see uh, here the, in the top left, that um, when the 50% uh, was reached, when we should have stopped the study, we had to wait several months for the imaging to confirm. And as a result, um, we had this prolonged period of time 
where we were over-treating. We were basically eliminating the sensitive population. And what we found was that the models suggested that by eliminating the sensitive population, we lost our ability to suppress the growth of the resistant population and, um, and as a result, lost control of the tumor. So basically, we over-treat consistently. What the models suggested, if we, if we had de designed the protocol slightly differently, we would have achieved similar kinds of results to those four uh, in about 10 of the 17, that um, uh, 10 of the 13 that we see here. So that's control. And there's a, a just there's a, there's a number of trials going on in Europe and in the US uh, looking at this in a larger uh, population with uh, randomization and so forth. So I'm going to go on to another topic, um, which which is a new topic for me, at least. Um, and the, the question is, can, can evolution provide insights into strategies for, for cancer cure? Um, and if you asked me about two years ago, my answer would be unequivocally no. Um, the, but basically, I think since the time of Ehrlich, who popularized this idea of magic bullets, this idea that there are agents that would selectively kill cancer cells, but not normal cells, that you could find them when, when antibiotics became uh, uh, or came around in the mid 20th century, his prediction seemed to be um, entirely valid. And so we've been looking for this, this idea of a single agent. Um, and, and I didn't think it was possible. I mean, I, I would have said that, that you cannot do it. Uh, this, the size, remember, a billion cells per cc of tumor, uh, phenotypic diversity, spatial dispersion, all are insurmountable burdens to cure. Um, but um, Damon Reed, uh, was, is, is an oncologist who works with pediatric patients. He works with teenagers who have sarcomas. Um, they die. When, the med when it's metastatic, they, they, they usually die. And um, he was tired of doing end-of-life uh, discussions with 18-year-olds and said, we, we, you know, you got to do better than that. Um, adaptive therapy is fine. Prolonging life, you know, several years is good. But when you're a teenager, that's not good enough. You need to go. And so a group of us now, uh, a mixture of evolutionary biologists, oncologists, and, um, and, and mathematicians, have been thinking about whether evolutionary dynamics can be used with the goal of cure. Um, so arguably, cure is, is extinction. Um, I mean, the goal is to cause extinction of the cancer clade an asexually reproducing clade. And when we think about extinction, we always go to the dinosaurs. Um, that's our sort of template for extinctions. Uh, application of a single massive uh, evolutionary force, um, in this case, the, the KT impact, which, which wiped out the mighty dinosaur clade. Um, what, what you tend to forget, though, is that the KT impact also destroyed about 60% of other land animal species. And so the problem with brute force as a mechanism of extinction is that it's indiscriminate. And I would argue that some of what we do with cancer therapy now is exactly this. We give maximum tolerated dose, maximum dose density. We, we give large amounts of dose. And those are pretty typically limited by toxicity to the normal cells, um, that indiscriminate effect. <clears throat> So is there an alternative? Um, we are living in the Anthropocene era, which that, and that means that our species is killing off lots of other species. And, and that's really tragic. Um, but the silver lining is that it has allowed evolutionary biologists to, to study extinction events almost in real time. Uh, a, a good example in the US is the passenger pigeon um, they were, the population was thought to be in the billions, probably the largest bird population on earth at the time. And it took uh, the European settlers about a hundred years to essentially wipe out this entire population. How did that happen? Well, I'm gonna show you, uh, this is uh, an intentional Anthropocene extinction, the Galapagos goats. Um, in the Galapagos Islands, famous of the Darwin, uh, sailors and pirates in the, in the 19th century uh, and, uh, would stop there and then they would put goats to provide food for them when they came back. And so these feral goats um, multiplied. And in the 1980s and 1990s, their population reached 500,000 or so. You can see they were um, the, uh, 
eating the, the native uh, foliage. They were crowding out native species. And the world community decided that, that um, they need to be removed. And this was Project Isabella. So what did they do? They, um, they took New Zealand sharpshooters, gave them automatic weapons, and put them in helicopters, and they drove around the islands and basically gunned down the herds. It was just a total slaughter. Um, and the population plummeted. It was a great initial effect. But then the population stabilized, and the population started to grow a little bit. And, and why was that? It's because um, the goats began to become sensitive to the sound of the helicopter. And what they would do is when they heard the helicopter, they would run into the woods where they couldn't be seen. And this mechanism of survival was sufficiently good that these populations actually started to grow. So they, they were small, fragmented uh, groups of goats uh, that were surviving. So what did they do? Um, they used what's called a Judas goat. Uh, this is a female goat who's neutered. They put a radio collar on her to track her, and they put hormones on her fur, send her out into the, uh, the woods, and she joins these goat populations. And they will, they use them to track down these small populations and kill. Them. And and as a result of that, the goat population has been extincted. This is a typical Anthropocene extinction. There's two steps to it. The first step reduces the population. It, it decreases the size, diversity, often leading to a, a fragmented surviving population, um, but almost never does this by itself cause extinction? Almost always what's called uh, evolutionary rescue occurs, which is what this was, and so survivors occur. But you'll notice here that, that, that after the first strike, there is then second strikes. There's, there's, there's additional perturbations that are applied to these small populations. Small populations are vulnerable to extinction uh, for a number of reasons. Um, and, and by, by applying a sequence of events, typically, um, you get what's called an extinction vortex. They, 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 they start to uh, multiply uh, and uh, um, as a result, the population slides into extinction because of perturbations that were unrelated to the first one. So does this have anything to do with cancer? And I think it does. So this is a pre and post, this is the same patient, breast cancer, pre and post neoadjuvant therapy. So that was the pre-treatment biopsy. This is the post-treatment surgery. Notice that you start with this very large population, neoadjuvant therapy was applied, and you got a tremendous response, but you'll also notice that there are survivors. Again, small separated populations. Um, just that that seem to be uh, isolated from one another, but nevertheless, they're survivors. Um, and this turns out to be a pretty standard look for cancers cells that survive therapy. Uh, they're not, you don't get a big cancer population that gets becomes smaller. It's actually fragmented into these, these small populations. Surprisingly little has been done in trying to understand why cancer cells survive therapy. And so we're starting to look at this. And this is a, another example. This is another breast cancer that responded uh, very well to uh, new adjuvant therapy, but left behind surviving cells. Look at these cells. Now, these, unlike the, the, the ones that I just showed you, these are really quite well um, um, differentiated. They are forming pseudoducts, um, but they're, but they're in, indeed malignant cells. And we're learning a few things about these cells. One is that they're uh, they, they are uh, they are not uh, proliferating, nor are they dying. They're completely um, sitting there doing nothing. They're actually pretty well differentiated, but they are highly metabolically stressed. Uh, they produce large amounts of VEGF, GLUT1, TIF1, carbonidase, ionized dyne, all of those things that would suggest that they are under hypoxic stress, which makes sense because you really don't see any blood vessels in there. So what we're beginning to do is to see, you know, what are their weaknesses? What are the things that we could attack them with? Um, the other thing we've learned uh, in the last year is that you can put a, a, a treatment on, on cancer cells and 
you, you what will what you'll find is that you will leave behind small numbers of survivors that and we don't know quite why they survive but it may be stochastic um and but they will sit there for sometime months in the presence of the therapy and then about three to four months later suddenly begin to afraid um and they will they will become then they will push right and be resistant to the uh to the therapy the um so, so what do you think are the genetic differences? So we, we start with a, with a parental line. We have surviving cells that are maybe 10 or 12 in a dish. And then we have those cells that are proliferating. So what are, the, what are the genetics of those three different populations? Well, they're, they're identical. Um, there are no mutations. We do not select for any pre-existing pre mutations. This is all done epigenetically. So cancer cells have the ability to epigenetically modify themselves, to pick from the human genome, adaptive strategies that allow them to first survive and then proliferate in the presence of, of, of virtually every, every therapy that we've seen. And importantly, these guys are killed by hypermethylating agents. So, so they are powerful, but they have Achilles heels. So um, just sort of finishing up here, there's, so it, what uh, the model suggests is that the, the application of the second strike um, to, ex to, to cause extinction of the, of the cancer population is uh, extremely dependent on timing. Um, if you give it at the beginning, when you've got, uh, you, you know, just add another uh, uh, treatment on top of the first treatment, um, you get a generally better response, but as has been shown clinically, you do not get eradication of the cancer cells. You're, you're actually putting them both on the population when it's largest and most likely to have uh, cancer cells with adaptive strategies pre-existing. If you wait too late, when the cancer cell has grown and, and is now has progressed, you have a larger and more heterogeneous population also too late. When you can, but if you apply therapy when the population is under is, is going down or at the peak of response, <clears throat> in that period of time, what they what this shows is additional perturbations at that point uh, are the, are uh, likely to cause extinction. And I think I can do this. No, I can't. Uh, oh, no, well, this is mod the, this has been modeled. You can see so too early don't get extinction, too late, you don't get extinction. There's a window of opportunity um, very much in the middle. So timing is, has to be very good. So this is what we propose, is that um, if you start with that mixture of cell population, you know, you, you give it a, a solid dose of therapy, you have a tremendous reduction in size. Um, we, 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 you know, we can, can try and adapt therapy, but if you want to go for extinction, you need to add a sequence of, of perturbations, each of which is different from the first one, each of which should probably be different from each other in various ways. But the idea then is that because uh, you're exploiting um, statistical variation, now it's small populations with uh, if a, a brief or transient decrease in birth rate or death rate or increase in death rate can cause it to go to extinction. Um, there's also a Lee effect where uh, as the population gets smaller, the ability of cells to help each other declines. And so as each decline, you get further and further loss of these things, further vulnerability. So this, this is the extinction vortex. Um, so if it just, and this is my last slide. If, if we, let's consider the prostate cancer group. So I, I mentioned that if you start, this is the uh, tumor volume. If you have uh, a point where you've, you've got tumor pre presenting, you give androgen deprivation therapy, 95% of the time, the androgen deprivation therapy causes the, the PSA to normalize or even become uh, in, uh, immeasurable. So what do, the, what, what do the oncologists do now? Well, they continue to give androgen deprivation therapy until it progresses. And so second line therapy begins here when the, when the tumor has progressed, has gotten larger and more heterogeneous. What we suggest is that you move it here, that that at the time of PSA, maximum PSA response, you give a series of strikes with the goal of then eradicating the, the small resistant population. And I will say that our first extinction trial has now accrued 20 patients. And the, the protocol uh, calls for a uh, preliminary analysis at this point. So 
Um, we'll see how this, whether this works or not. Um, those of you who are familiar with oncology, this might sound familiar. Um, this is actually the empirically derived curative therapy for pediatric leukemia. Um, there's an induction period, and what they've learned is that at the end of the induction period, you, you, you often don't see tumor cells in the bone marrow or blood, but what they've learned is that it always comes back. And so after the induction period, they then immediately began a consolidation period with different drugs, and then frequently after that, another period of, again with different drugs, um, and that's essentially the mechanism that's, that's used. That is basically the first strike, second strike approach that you get from anthropocene extinctions. Um, I would also point out <clears throat> that this is something that we can be used in management therapy where the explicit goal is to, is to remove small populations. Um, and it is interesting that what we know is that uh, current management therapy works well when the primary tumor is small, but gets less and less effective as the primary tumor gets larger, suggesting that as the, the microscopic population increases in size, that the single strike kind of event that occurs uh, that's used for, for adjuvant and neoadjuvant therapy is insufficient. And so this is another group that we're starting to look at. Um, and with that, I, I will thank everybody involved. This is the Evolution Tumor Board. Um, this is a group run by oncologists with evolutionary biologists and cancer uh, and mathematicians involved where specific patients are discussed uh, and advice is given regarding the evolutionary dynamics to be expected. Uh, we start with the meeting with the uh, evolutionary biologists, the mathematicians, and the oncologists. They write the, the equations down for the treatment, and then that's used to develop uh, 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 simulations that are presented at the subsequent meeting. At this point, we're actually talking to the patient, so it's, it's, a, it's a very um, patient-oriented kind of approach. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you for this kind introduction. I have to say I'm not co-director of the Department of Pathology and Molecular Pathology. I'm, I'm a co-head of the unit of molecular pathology within the Department of Pathology. So we have only one director, that is Holger Moch. Uh, I, I'm uh, very happy to share actually this vision that we have uh, in molecular pathology. I named this presentation multimodal analysis and data integration in molecular pathology, leveraging the power of combined data insights. Um, yeah, I'm MD-PhD, I have a special interest in tumor immunology, and um, I'm senior physician or in German Leiden der Ärzte and co-head of um, this unit of molecular pathology. So I, st I thought to start with some general aspects on multimodal data integration and the question, of course, why should we actually aim for this yeah, very challenging task? So what we are doing currently, and this is actually not even true, we are not entirely doing this, but that's with the focus on pathology, of course, you can add different disciplines in there, such as radiology. So maybe we get treatment information from the patient, disease-free survival data, overall survival data. In pathology, we contribute a lot to um, the diagnosis, so we give the histological diagnosis, staging, grading. Sometimes we do evaluate tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. We may also provide you with an immune diagnosis, and we may use um, AI for digital pathology and um, image analysis. In molecular pathology, of course, we're doing sequencing and sequence analysis, and then currently, as clinicians, we meet almost daily for different tumor boards to discuss those results and to find the best predictive or prognostic um, information for the patient. Now, what I think at least would be great if we had a digital biobank with all this data in there, and then we could start to play around. So maybe with machine learning or networks, and we could use different models to fuse features to, to um, perform unsupervised or supervised subtype discovery. And in the end, we could get the most holistic view on, on cancer. Uh, this could assist clinical decision-making. And of course, we hope to discover novel predictive and prognostic markers. Now, this whole issue about multi-model um, data integration, that is actually rather new. So often it's referred to as multi-omics data integration. That's maybe more common. And here on the left side, um, those are actually very nice papers that just um, were released last year. 
Um, this group I found particularly interesting because they also um, have this MSK mind consortium where they particularly focus on this topic. This is a very nice review regarding um, algorithms and um, data um, base for multi omics data integration and interpretation. And I think that's an interesting um, thought about how to contain uh, those data and to have a framework to use and to work with. Now, what are the challenges? And I think there are actually two major challenges to, um, to, to multi-model data integration. So the first is data management issues. And that is, I think, the, the most important thing that especially also as clinicians or um, head of a particular unit that creates data, we need to work on. So the data are not yet available in a research-ready format. That's, they're not structured, they're not annotated, maybe they're not curated. And as in a database, we basically we can't work with the data as you would like it. Also data reproducibility, um, that's a very important issue for diagnostic work. So we are not in research by di but in diagnostics. In fact, we do face the hardware and software issues. So we need more storage space, uh, we need more computing power. Um, sometimes we like clinical data, like follow-up treatment response. Um, if you think about uh, machine learning, of course, you would like this not only for our center here, the Univers University Hospital of Zurich, but for multi-centers. So we would need cross-institutional studies. I don't know who's involved in those national-wide studies. It's all very interesting, but also very time-consuming. And we need cross-expertise coordination. So we must um, have an exchange between clinician scientists and data scientists. Then regarding methodological limitations, we have heterogeneity in data types, formats, and scales. I will show you later on, um, of course, issues related to data um, quality, pre-processing, and normalization, missing data, big issue, um, too few data for those models, or we don't really know how to interpret the results in the end. Now, with this, I'd like to move on, and um, I will show you our um, efforts on, on actually only this part for the moment. And then later on, after finishing this, I will move to this, the first steps towards multi-omics, actually not multi-model data. So the goal would be also to include imaging data, not only omics, like genomics, transcriptomics, epigenomics, and so forth. So we are starting here now, and actually we are starting down there. So this is the first steps to unimodal data from molecular pathology, and I will focus on diagnostic whole genome sequencing. And this has been done, or most of this work has been done by Cassandra Litchfield. She's a bioinformatician from the Peter McCallum Institute in Australia, who's working with us. And um, so you may think, well, whole genome sequencing has been around since ages, so why is it such a thing to, to actually test it and to provide it for diagnostics? But it's it's actually not so easy. So what we did is we had this tumor profiler melanoma cohort. The tumor profiler um, was a study performed among different uh, institutions and with different malignancies. And one of them was uh, melanoma. And for the routine assessment, those patients, um, they all had metastatic melanoma and they had received foundation one um, sequence analysis from from this formalin fixated paraffin embedded material. And foundation one is FDA approved, so we thought it's a good way to use it as ground truth. And we, what we then did is we uh, used patient matched PDMCs as germline uh, control and um, to test now whole genome sequencing, we used the very same aliquot that we had used from the FFP material for whole genome sequencing with a coverage of at least 60X and then 30X normal tissue. And then we evaluated different pipelines. So we used the Hardwick Medical Foundation, which provides uh, open source tools to evaluate those data sets and the Dragon Pipeline from Illumina. Now we'll focus on those first results. This is um, just what the Hardwick Medical Foundation provides its tools. And we have actually more or less used all of them by now with very promising results. Now, this is what it looks like, the validation foundation one versus the dragon pipeline. And we selected just those 324 genes that are covered by the foundation one assay. And uh, here we are looking at single nucleotide variants. You can see that the dragon pipeline in whole genome sequencing is missing a few. It's detecting most of them and then, uh, for patho 
genic SMVs, it's, it's similar, but very good correlation. Um, and the same for the Hartwig Medical Foundation, in fact. And when we looked at the Venn diagram, so those um, SMVs that were missed were actually missed by both, uh, both our pipelines. And um, usually there were either germlines, so Foundation One does in sequence germlines, so of course um, they don't know whether this is a germline variant or not, and, um, and therefore it was called, or they had a very low um, allelic frequency. We also validated the copy number variations and the TMB, which was very in, um, yeah, correlated very well. And what we need to do is validation of invals, structure variants, and MPNs. MNP, sorry. We um, plotted um, those first results of those metastatic melanoma in this onco plot, and um, they are here sorted according to the mutational subtype. So we have here the BRAF mutated groups. We colored BRAF V600, which is a type 1 BRAF mutation and targetable in orange, and all others are now in green here. And um, what we were wondering is. So here above, you see the HRD score, which is the composite score of those three uh, markers, LOH, uh, LST, and TIE, um, and at least for serious ovarian high-grade cancer, and their LST above 42 is predictive for PARP inhibition. And given that those patients are end-stage melanoma patients, we we're wondering whether there could be an increased HRDness in those metastatic patients, something that we wouldn't have picked up with targeted panel sequencing. And uh, we've also started looking into the path and mutation burden. And um, yeah, we need to explore this further for the moment. Um, only a few show actually alterations in this HRD pathway, but we can't extend it for all patients. Interesting, we also have quite some true wild type melanomas that remain wild type even when performing whole genome sequencing. Now, this is something that is very clinically oriented now, but this is what we um, are hardly working on and what we'd like to provide, at least for a subgroup of patients, because the validation seems so promising. So we aim at um, providing whole genome sequencing for at least um, a subgroup of patients where we provide genetic alterations, complex biomarkers, including HLA, chromoplexy events, CMV profile signatures, and also the metagenome. We have quite some ongoing projects in our unit. Um, so for whole genome sequencing, we are performing HLA typing. That's almost finished. Uh, we will look at indel and uh, CMV signatures, and we will extract the non-human reads to identify the metagenome. We are also working on whole transcriptome analysis and on whole slide imaging for AI's assessed tumor cell content. Now with this, I'd like to introduce uh, to you my uh, co-head, Jan Rushoff. So we are heading this, this unit of molecular pathology at the center uh, of our department. And in fact, uh, we are a very large team uh, overall at the Institute. Um, so we have two groups, one here in the center and one in Schlieren. We have also two lab heads, one in Nienholt and Martin Soche, and also for the lab team for this particular work that I ha uh, have been showing all the evaluation um, some of them have been uh, actively involved. And of course, we also thank um, our biobank, um, Victor Kölzer, for imaging support in Hogemar. And with this, I'd like to leave this diagnostic part. And um, I just want to show you how hard it is to provide really true, good, and curated uh, data sets uh, for further analysis. And I would like to move on to this multimodal data um, uh, subject. So this is uh, currently only performed in research. And actually, this topic occurred to me during one of our many tumor profile meetings. <laughs> I was thinking that somatic mutations in, in, in the tumor may impact the composition of the tumor in your microenvironment. And I got particularly interested in prostate cancer. And for this, we are um, using a multi-omics data integration approach. This work has been performed by Fabius Wiesmann, my PhD student, and again, Cassandra Letchfield. I will shortly introduce you to the study design. So um, we collected a discovery cohort of um, prostate or of treatment naive prostate cancer patients. We also have some healthy controls in there. And of course, in pathology, we performed um, staging, grading, 
we got eight and preoperative PSA values, sorry. And um, we collected prostate tissue in a very defined way. So we had um, fresh tissue for high dimensional flow cytometry. This is this year, which was performed together um, in my former institute, the Institute of Experimental Immunology, together with Sonia Chuks and Burkhard Becher. Then we had snap frozen tissue, which we subjected to whole genome sequencing. And then the next slide was um, formalin fixated tissue for con conventional pathology, but also for digital pathology. And before I will come to this, like attempts for data integration, I will show you some first results of every modality on its own. Um, so we, we designed a, um, multiplexed uh, antibody panel for high dimensional flow cytometry. We identified all mm, major immune cells and we decided to focus on adaptive immunity. And you can see here the subcluster analysis with different um, uh, I, um, differentiated um, yeah, adaptive immune cells. And what we found interesting is that when we looked at whether those correlated actually with age or with the disease or with both, because in the prostate, you in contrast to, let's say, uh, breast cancer, as you showed in breast cancer, for pathologists, it's, it's actually quite easy. You have the breast cancer in one place, and then you have surrounding healthy tissue. For prostate cancer, it's different. It crawls between healthy glands. So you always have a mixture of healthy and cancerous tissue. And what we observed is that some of those uh, immune cells are uh, associated rather with age, some with the disease, and um, yeah, only a few tissue resident memory cells um, with both. So that's actually, we thought, an interesting finding given that prostate cancer occurs with age and um, this whole inflammation concept is actually poorly described in the prostate. What we also thought is that it's probably not going to be one immune cell or one marker that is associated or correlated to one of the other type of uh, prostate cancer, but it's probably rather the immune microenvironment uh, as like a whole whole environment. And um, so um, we, we tried to, to group those um, and identified four uh, immune subtypes, which we named according to the most prevalent um, subtype. And we identified a time which carries more effective cells, some carry more B cells or different kinds of tissue resident memory cells. We also performed this whole genome sequencing very similar to what you've seen for melanoma. Again, uh, this oncoplot, and um, this time um, they are actually sorted by the Gleason grade group. So from low grade to high grade, most of them were ETS rearranged as expected. Um, some carried SPOP um, alterations. And what I personally found interesting has been described, but not very well explored, is this RB1 bucket to um, LOH in quite some patients. What we've also done is we've calculated chromoplexy. So may, you may know that prostate cancer has a highly destructed chromosome, and uh, you can count uh, those changed events and the, yeah, it remains to be discussed whether this may also cause new antigenicity, given that maybe there are new, new transcripts that develop. We performed, sorry, we performed um, also CMV analysis, and you can see here those BRCA2 RB1 um, losses or LOHs. Now to this multi-omics data integration part, and yes, just at the beginning, and I'm very happy, um, of course, also later on to maybe discuss an exchange thoughts on this. So if you have a look in literature, there is still, even though this is, um, it seems to be rather, of course, uh, interesting, <laughs> there is not so much around, especially if you have different scale data and if you have different types of data. So for me as a clinician, it seems that there are different approaches. So one is principal component analysis, and we've also done this. So we performed um, MOFA. Um, then we also once thought that maybe we should avoid distinct clustering, um, and we used a graph-based cluster-free approach based on k-nearest neighbors, where we modified a previous published um, algorithm. And then recently we have started um, genome-wide association studies 
where we saw that the genetic alteration is the predictor and the immune subtype is the dependent variable. And we also considered covariates such as age and tumor cell content. Um, later on, to make actually sense of those data, we um, we would like at least to perform gene set enrichment analysis on network propagation. And I will show you a very pre preliminary uh, genome-wide association plot um, that we did. So in this Manhattan plot here, you can see the chromosomes, the genes uh, altered. And we also plotted in color the, the effect that this alteration of the gene had on this particular immune cell. Um, and of course, as such, it's an overview, but we need to explore this further. Yeah, I, I mentioned this, so what we've uh, also become interested in is um, network propagation because um, what sounds interesting is that the top-ranked genes that you observe can be reassociated by uh, neighbors. The, the problem is that you have this given protein-protein interaction network. You did this also on the string network, and you can re-rank your genes. You can identify novel genes, and you may actually explore and um, pathways and get more information. It's also apparently um, suited for our small group. We actually have a larger validation cohort, which I didn't show you. And um, yeah, we hope to get a mechanistic understanding of uh, complex interactions. And I think it's, it's very nicely reviewed um, already six years ago. And, and this is what Fabius tried. It's very, uh, for, uh, we can't interpret it now, but I think it's just to show you how we try to approach um, this issue. Now, with this, I'd like to conclude. And um, I've shown you that for diagnostics and for all further purpose, we are hardly working on establishing robust sequencing analysis. And um, um, yeah, also to put them in, into a structured, annotated, and uh, curated data set that is available then for further analysis. Um, for us clinicians, it's essential to have um, reproducible data. Um, we have actively increased um, across expertise in our team, so we have recruited more and more bioinformaticians. I think by now you can't run a larger unit of molecular pathology without bioinformaticians, and maybe we can also collaborate with you. We are sometimes already. And um, in research, we are attempting um, yeah, multi-omics approaches for data integration, and we've tried in principle, or more or less this principle component analysis, a graph-based approach, and genome-wide association studies. Now, with this, I'd like to thank you. I think molecular pathology is great, and there, the sky is not the limit. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. We have recently started working with liquid biopsies, and I would like to uh, share with you my enthusiasm for uh, the topic. So liquid biopsies are um, working with um, bodily fluids, and therefore they are minimally invasive. And thanks to uh, novel technological advances, they are quite affordable. So you can repeat them more frequently than some other monitoring methods, for example, like uh, imaging. Um, here in this illustrated uh, tra patient trajectory, I'm... Um, just showing how through continuous monitoring um, you can uh, identify uh, relapse or disease progression uh, much sooner than with traditional radiographic or solid biopsy monitoring. And we work with cell-free DNA sequencing, so that's what I'm going to uh, talk about. Um, the origin of uh, cell-free DNA is uh, from usually from dead cells, but also uh, some living cells secrete cell-free DNA into the bloodstream. Um, most of what we can uh, sequence comes from blood cells. However, we also um, sequence DNA from um, highly vascularized tissues, such as the liver or tumors, if the patients have any. Cell-free DNA is highly fragmented. In the blood, it is degraded by DNases. Basically, what we can sequence are um, the DNA fragments that are protected by these nucleosomes. Inside the cell, inside the nucleus, DNA is wrapped around um, these protein molecules. Um, and uh, when the cells die and the DNA is released into the tissues or the bloodstream, 
uh, these uh, protein molecules uh, protect uh, the DNA from degradation. And if we look at uh, the length uh, distribution of uh, cell-free DNA, we can also see that um, we see a peak at around 166 uh, base pairs, which is the length of, uh, of, uh, of the DNA wrapped around the nucleosome and the short linker sequence. We can um, use targeted methods for um, analyzing cell-free DNA. Uh, so we can look for cancer-specific point mutations or translocations. However, uh, we use a more um, cancer agnostic method, meaning uh, that we don't need to, uh, need to have prior knowledge about the tumor. So with uh, whole genome sequencing, we can identify amplifications or uh, deletions, and we can look at epigenetic modifications. First, I'm going to talk about amplifications and deletions, which are together also called uh, copy number alterations. Copy number refers to the number of copies the, the genome is uh, present inside the cell. And in healthy um, individuals, that's uh, normally in two copies. Um, and therefore, in healthy individuals in the cell free DNA, uh, we see a copy number neutral uh, state. However, in um, uh, cancer patients, we often see uh, amplifications in red or deletions. This is a, an esophagus adenocarcinoma patient from, um, from the University Hospital of Zurich. And we can also use copy number variants uh, for monitoring. Here I'm going to present the trajectory of a metastatic prostate cancer patient. And I'm going to be tying back into Bob's uh, earlier presentation quite a, uh, a lot in this presentation. Um, so in the um, at the baseline sample, uh, we can see a lot of uh, copy number variants um, in this patient, um, a drastic amplification of the long arm of chromosome 8, but also several uh, deletions. And this prostate cancer patient was uh, treated at the radio-oncology, it was irradi irradiated. Uh, with high-intensity in high radiotherapy, and already on day two, we see a marked reduction of these uh, copy number alterations. And uh, if I pass uh, further in time, on day five, uh, we barely see any uh, copy number alterations. And this is where the therapy for this patient ended, um, because it was already a metastatic uh, prostate cancer. Um, this high intensity uh, radiotherapy is, uh, was the, the choice of treatment for this patient and then was followed up. In the follow up sample, um, we still see um, some signs of um, um, and copy number alterations, um, which are quite reduced, but due to the genomic locations of these alterations, if I go back to the baseline sample, we can see that it is the same uh, copy number alteration on the long arm of chromosome 8. Um, we can see that these are uh, specific to this uh, cancer that the patient has, and therefore we can say that uh, this patient had residual tumor. And uh, if we go further um, along the, the follow-up samples, um, we see that six months after uh, the cessation of radiotherapy, uh, the patient relapsed and we see the same copy number uh, alterations that we have seen in the baseline sample. And it um, persisted even a year after radiotherapy. Um, so we can also compare these copy number alterations uh, with the imaging data that we have from uh, this patient. Here, I'm going to show uh, corresponding images, um, so baseline and uh, six months after radiotherapy. These are uh, PSMA um, PET-CT images. Uh, so the contrast medium is uh, accumulating in glands. So for example, the salivary glands um, in the liver and the kidneys. So these are highlighted in black. And uh, this here is not the prostate. Uh, this patient had a prostatectomy prior uh, to this treatment. Uh, this is the pelvic bone metastasis that this, uh, these are the two pelvic uh, bone metastases that, uh, that this patient uh, had 
prior uh, to uh, radiotherapy. And uh, um, six months after radiotherapy, we can see um, a dis disseminated bone metastases in the six months follow-up uh, image. As I have mentioned in the introduction, uh, besides um, copy number alterations, we can also use epigenetic clues in the cell free DNA for monitoring. And this um, is made possible um, by um, the nucleosome footprints that we, we detect um, in cell free DNA because the, the DNA segments that we sequence are the sequence are, are the DNA segments that were protected by nucleosomes. So basically, uh, with this sequencing, uh, we can find out where the nucleosomes were in uh, in the cells, and um, the nucleosome coverage of a cell is basically um, indicative of its cell type. Different cell types of our body have the same genome, but are covered by nucleosomes in different genomic locations. So simply by um, tying back where we sequence uh, these cell free DNA sequences, we can uh, find out um, where nucleosomes were in the cells that contributed to the cell free DNA. And as you may well know, um, highly expressed genes are usually not covered by nucleosomes, or at least the promoter regions of them are uh, mm, not covered by a lot of uh, nucleosomes. Um, and in contrast, inactive genes are uh, usually silenced by a dense coverage of nucleosomes. So um, we expect to see, uh, in highly express, expressed genes, we expect to see a drop in the coverage in our um, cell free DNA sequencing. And indeed, this is what we see um, here I'm showing Half, uh, samples of healthy individuals, and uh, uh, we assayed hematopoietic specific promoters. So these are uh, blood cell specific uh, promoters, and uh, we see that the uh, the coverage at the promoter regions is um, is decreased in um, um, in healthy in, in the cell DNA of healthy individuals, um, but it is not so for other. Uh, cell type specific promoters. And to tie this back to uh, the patients that I've presented uh, before, again, I will highlight uh, this um, uh, copy number alteration um, that is uh, quite marked in this patient and uh, the longitudinal uh, measurements of these. And below, I'm showing um, the prostate specific uh, promoter regions and the cell free DNA coverage of these regions in these patients. And we can see that at baseline, um, we see a marked contribution from prostate cells, uh, which uh, decreases over time only to reappear six months and uh, 12 months after uh, radiotherapy. And uh, we can also compare this to the clinical picture. Um, here uh, uh, above, I'm showing uh, these prostate-specific nucleosome footprints. Um, and uh, below, I have the prostate-specific antigen uh, measurements of this uh, patient, which um, show the same response to the treatment and, uh, and also the relapse that is also uh, picked up by this uh, PSA measurement eventually. In a larger cohort of uh, lung cancer patients, uh, we have correlated the, the tumor fraction uh, to this cell type signature that we measure by these nucleosome footprints. Um, so we looked at small airway epithelial cell uh, promoters, uh, which are practically lung cell uh, promoters, and, uh, and looked at the cell type um, signatures of them in lung cancer patients. And we see a strong correlation uh, between tumor fraction and uh, this small airway epithelial cell uh, promoter signature. And we also see a negative correlation uh, between hematopoietic uh, signature and the tumor fraction 
which is probably caused by the dilution of uh, the hematopoietic signal by uh, the, the tumor cell-free DNA. So we can use um, nucleosome footprints to identify uh, which cell types contribute to the cell-free DNA. However, Peter Ulz and his colleagues went even a step further. Um, they managed to capture um, a prostate cancer um, during um, subtype transition, um, namely an adenocarcino uh, prostate adenocarcinoma that transitioned into neuroendocrine um, uh, prostate cancer. This is significant because um, adenocarcinoma, prostate adenocarcinoma, uh, responds um, uh, to um, 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 hormone inhibition, and uh, um, neuroendocrine cancers are uh, castration resistant and are uh, more aggressive uh, than adenocarcinomas and are more difficult uh, to treat. And what they have uh, measured were uh, nucleosome footprints over uh, transcription factor binding sites. So here you can see transcription factors. And on the left side, uh, they show uh, adenocarcinoma uh, samples. And on the right side, they have patients that have uh, neuroendocrine prostate cancer. And in the middle, uh, we have this one patient that started out with aden a prostate adenocarcinoma and then transitioned into a neuroendocrine uh, cancer which um, at baseline had, uh, which at baseline expressed um, androgen receptor like adenocarcinoma samples do, um, but uh, this then um, decreased following the treatment and instead developed this more um, neuroendocrine-like um, signature. So to quickly recap, um, with the liquid biopsy, uh, we can, uh, more continuously monitor cancer patients, and um, we also get molecular information from the tumor that is otherwise uh, only possible uh, through solid biopsies. However, there are also limitations. For example, not all tumors shed cell-free DNA, and also um, low tumor fraction samples have a weak signal, and we're uh, currently working on um, improving uh, this signal detection. I would like to uh, thank the contribution to um, my colleagues at the, the Krauthammer Lab and also our collaborations here, our collaborators here in Zurich and also in Amsterdam. And thank you for your attention. Well, today uh, I would like to talk about alternative splicing. Um, I have been working now on alternative splicing for a couple of years, and um, today I would like to share with you some of the findings um, that, uh, that we made um, over the years. And uh, in particular, maybe what I can do is introduce you first to what alternative splicing is, uh, because I know that not all of you are biologists, uh, some are also pure IT specialists. So um, in, the, in our genome, we have uh, DNA fragments that are encoding um, genetic sequences um, in eukaryotes. So in humans, um, these segments of uh, genes, they are actually uh, consisting of uh, so-called exons and introns. Exons are the regions that are then ending up to code uh, protein sequences, while intronic uh, sequences are actually uh, cut out and uh, left in the nucleus uh, for degradation. Um, so um, I don't want to talk about you know uh, why our cells are doing this, but this is um, simply a fact. I mean, um, over 60% of our genes are spliced or are consisting of multi-exonic uh, uh, or are consisting of multi-exons, and uh, almost all of them are undergoing uh, splicing. So this is a fundamental uh, process. And what we can see now is in normal cells, so we have the DNA, um, um, for example, you know, uh, the gene here from a normal uh, tissue, and we have the same gene actually in a, a, second, um, in a second tissue, in a second uh, probe, uh, for example. In that case, let's assume it's a cancer probe. So 
With splicing, what happens is, um, so in this case, for example, you would cut out uh, these introns and then you would fuse um, or splice these exons, the four exons uh, together. And this then gives us a transcript, so-called transcript. The transcript is mRNA. Uh, so we know from COVID now what mRNA is. So these mRNA vaccines, and this is kind of similar stuff. Uh, so these uh, transcripts are mRNA. But as you can see here, in this case, the exon has been skipped, in which case uh, this copy of the gene consists only of three exons, so not anymore of uh, four exons. And there was uh, one interesting finding um, that uh, when we look into all all the transcripts um, that are expressed um, by genes, we can see that uh, many times there is one dominant uh, transcript or one type of transcript that is most dominantly expressed, and all the other transcripts are actually uh, uh, lower expressed. And in this case, you can appreciate um, here that, uh, you know, the first rank is really significantly higher expressed than the, the remaining. So, in the, and we, we, or we talk about these transcripts here that are most dominant expressed, we, we name them uh, most dominant uh, transcripts. And um, what we can, or what we have observed ourselves and also others in the past is, that uh, no, this is again kind of similar. So these are three different transcripts um, that are that were detected in a set of normal samples. And what we can see in cancer, often the most dominant transcript is switched. So in this case, you know, you see it's not anymore the green transcript that is most dominantly expressed, but in this case, it's a blue transcript. And the blue transcript is usually lowly expressed in a normal tissue. And this is kind of uh, very interesting because now, these switches in the most dominant transcripts will have some effects on uh, the cells and can actually have a phenotypic effect. So what type of phenotypic effect can it have? So what we can, for example, do is we can look at, um, so at the final end, the transcript will be transcribed or translated into a protein sequence. And the protein sequence will then, or most proteins, are forming protein complexes. A protein, in order to do its function, it needs to form a, a complex with other proteins proteins and in this case you can appreciate you know this protein for example consists in a simple manner now you know consists of three uh, uh, three domains and the red domain would be now uh, encoded by the red exon here now this transcript obviously because it doesn't have the red exon anymore uh, this transcript will not be able to encode the red domain so this protein will be smaller and if you now assume that this um, protein domain, the red domain, is important for protein-protein interactions, you can, you know, you can uh, imagine um, without any problems that this uh, the switch in the most dominant transcript to this transcript will disrupt protein interactions. And in this case, you see the red um, domain here is important for the interaction with this node here, with this protein. These are all proteins and um, the edge is the interaction. And in this case, obviously the interaction would be lost. So this protein is not any more able to interact with its interaction partner. So we talk here in that case about uh, disrupted protein interactions. And this concept, what we did is, so we developed software um, um, and also databases to analyze um, now these switches, most dominant transcript switches, and also uh, look into what their impact, their functional impact is. And we did this in the context of a large international consortium. Um, the consortium uh, project was initiated by the International Cancer Genomics Consortium, and the project was called PCOG for pan cancer analysis of whole genomes. And the nice thing about the PCOG project was that we had not only mutational data available from whole genome sequencing data, and when we heard already a couple of times about whole genome sequencing today, but at the same time, on the same patient samples, we had also RNA-seq uh, data available, so transcriptome, transcript expression uh, data available. And this is the RNA-seq uh, uh, data is our uh, basic or our raw data that we use for analyzing alternative uh, splicing changes. And our idea then was for this PCOG, in this PCOG project, um, can we detect um, alternative splicing changes in um, different cancer types? 
And uh, I didn't mention that here, but uh, the Peacock project had a lot of different cancer types. Um, so we had over 27 different, or we, we looked into 27 um, different um, cancer types. And for all of the 27 different cancer, cancer types, we analyzed the alternative splicing changes and uh, the impact of those splicing changes um, on protein interaction networks. So when we look now into, first of all, into our data set, just very simply, okay, how many times can we detect these significant most dominant uh, transcripts per gene in all of the samples? We could see that for the peacock data, as well as uh, for normal data, the normal uh, tissue data was retrieved from the GTEx project, which is another project. Um, and uh, in for, 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 for cancer and for normal data, in generally, in general, we can detect about 67%. For 67% of genes, we can detect the most dominant transcript. So this idea that one uh, transcript all, all is always dominantly expressed is also something that uh, we saw in our data. Now, if we look now into how many switches we saw, so how many cancer-specific most dominant transcripts, because if there is a switch, then that most dominant transcript becomes now a cancer-specific most dominant transcript. So if you look now into the numbers of most dominant um, cancer-specific most dominant transcripts, we can generally uh, say that in total, we see these switches in 7,000 genes. And in total, we observed uh, 122,000 um, cancer-specific most dominant transcripts. And you can see here over um, the 27 different cancer types for each sample, the number of most dominant uh, transcripts uh, that we observed. And in the red numbers here are the median numbers. And uh, there are a couple of interesting findings. So first of all, we had one or two where uh, the median or where there was actually no uh, cancer-specific most dominant transcripts. So the sample looked the cancer sample looked identical in terms of splicing at least uh, to the normal uh, tissue. Uh, but uh, there were also um, cases where we would expect actually large number of uh, changes in alternative splicing. First of all, in case of melanoma, melanoma is uh, usually the cancer type which has a lot of mutations because you have UV. I mean, they are caused by UV radiation, and UV radiation as an exogenous mutagen produces a lot of mutations. So, melanoma tends to have a large mutational burden. But in terms of splicing, it seems to be quite silent. So there is not much change in uh, terms of splicing. And brain is also interesting because brain is usually, uh, uh, brain tissue is usually known to have different uh, splicing or where functional uh, you know, splicing can change um, uh, depending on uh, the neuronal cell types. But uh, we don't see actually uh, lots of difference in terms of, uh, you know, brain cancer and uh, brain normal tissue. And then the uh, other findings is um, that uh, when you look a bit carefully, then you will um, realize that very often cancer types of the same primary tissue tend to be similar in their uh, number of uh, cancer-specific most dominant transcripts. So, for example, lung is close to lung, liver is close to liver, and so on. So this is also something that uh, we, could, um, we could observe and which makes a little bit also sense um, to, um, that they are grouping um, together. But very interesting is that at the far end, and with the highest number of most dominant as cancer specific most dominant transcripts, we have uh, female reproduction organs, which is uh, very interesting. So we have here, you know, um, uterus cancer, ovarian cancer, cervix uh, cancer. There is pancreas cancer, interestingly, also at the second um, second rank. But nevertheless, you know, it's quite interesting that uh, the female reproduction organs have uh, these high number of. Um, cancer-specific most dominant uh, transcripts. And one interesting finding, uh, for example, for pancreas cancer, uh, so, um, I mean, as I mentioned, so we have over 122,000. Um, I just wanted to mention one interesting finding here, which is uh, from uh, ubiquitin ligase, E3 ligase, called FBXW7. 
So this uh, we observed, um, or here we observed the cancer-specific most dominant uh, transcript in a, in a pancreas cancer sample. Actually, uh, we observed this in over 30% of pancreas cancer samples. And here you can see, for example, uh, we have, I'm, I'm just putting here next, um, this is um, the, the normal one, is uh, the normal one that we usually observe is FBX W7003. And the one that we see now in cancer dominantly expressed is O0.4. And you can observe, you know, it's really dominantly expressed um, and uh, compared uh, to the uh, other uh, transcript. And this um, transcript, as you can um, see here, so this is um, this is the normal one, this O3, uh, which encodes basically this domain structure. So you have here the F-box um, like uh, domain, and you have here the substrate binding domains, the WD40 domains. And uh, in this case, the one that we see here most frequently is actually this one here, which is on the very right hand side. So it doesn't actually encode at all uh, the substrate binding um, domains. And the effect is obviously that actually, you know, since it doesn't, uh, you know, encode the uh, WD40 domains, you see basically loss of interactions and you see loss of interactions against all of the interaction partners. And in this case, maybe you can um, see it a bit. So one of the interaction partners or substrates is mTOR. And then my question, I mean, when I saw this uh, one, uh, I had then obviously the question of whether these patients could actually receive mTOR inhibitors. I mean, there are approved mTOR inhibitors. Uh, the interesting thing is you now that uh, usually uh, FP, uh, FBXW7 is, um, is mutated on a nucleotide level uh, only in 4% of, um, of pancreas cancer patients, while actually we see splicing-wise uh, change in 37% of uh, pancreas um, cancer patients. Um, so this could hopefully be one of uh, these biomarkers that will help us uh, to identify patients uh, that could respond uh, to mTOR in inhibition. Um, when we look into the general uh, landscape of the PCOG um, data set, uh, one thing that we also observed is that uh, most of the most cancer-specific, most dominant transcripts are actually uh, transcripts that are or proteins that are encoding proteins that are actually interacting with known cancer-related genes. The cancer-related genes, maybe you know, you heard about COSMIC. There's a COSMIC, a COSMIC database, there's a mutational database uh, for which lists mutations in uh, cancer. And uh, when we look, and they have a list of uh, cancer-related genes, and when we look into the interaction uh, landscape, interaction network, and we simply count how many times do it does a uh, cancer-specific most dominant transcript protein interact with one of these genes? We see clearly there is um, over-representation of interactions next to cosmic genes compared to random a random selection uh, of genes from the interaction network. And this also let us then uh, believe that these cancer-specific most dominant transcripts have actually a pathogenic uh, role and they are not just uh, some random effects. We try to correlate the the expression of the transcripts uh, with mutational data, we saw sometimes, I mean, for very few cases, we could indeed identify mutations in close proximity to the transcript or to the uh, within the gene itself. Uh, but in most of the cases, actually, we couldn't identify a reason, a mutational reason, a genomic reason for these switches, for these changes in splicing. But what we definitely can say, nevertheless, is so if we look into the samples and simply count how many times uh, we see a cancer-specific mosome transcript and count um, how many of these uh, samples have a mutation in the spliceosome, which is the protein complex that, that is responsible for splicing, for splicing the, uh, tr uh, the transcripts or splicing out the introns, we can clearly see that as higher uh, or that spliceosome mutations tend to have a higher, or samples with spliceosome mutation tend to have a higher number of uh, these alternative splicing um, uh, 
transcript uh, changes. Uh, well, this is one project, one uh, study. Uh, the next thing that we wanted to do is um, that we wanted to, uh, you know, confirm our results, and we wanted to check actually, you know, how um, does our observe or how how is our method and our methodology and our results compared to other uh, projects? And here we joined the tumor profiler study. And uh, I don't want to tell too much about the tumor profiler study because we have one of the leading uh, leading figures of the tumor profiler study, Andreas Vicky, who is going to present after me. So I just want to, I want to mention that the tumor profiler study is looking into in, the, in its initial stage was looking into three different uh, cancer types and one of them was ovarian cancer and maybe you remember that ovarian cancer was one of the uh, cancer types with a high number of uh, these uh, cancer specific uh, transcripts uh, so this was obviously for us uh, a very perfect uh, playground and uh, this that's also what we then did and the nice thing is you have different in this uh, tumor profiler study you have different sets of uh, different uh, data types and if you uh, look carefully as he also bulk rna and also some uh, genome uh, genomic um, uh, mutational um, data available. So if you look into uh, now the tumor profiler study, the nice thing is that actually in ovarian cancer, we could identify 224 um, different uh, uh, transcripts, cancer-specific transcripts that we observed not only in the tumor profiler study, but that we observed also in TCGA and in the PEACOCK study uh, that I mentioned before. TCGA is the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is um, which was which is one of the data providers uh, for uh, for the Peacock uh, project, and here one uh, protein, one transcript that uh, stood out is uh, the transcript of uh, adosine uh, three, and adosine three is uh, one of these proteins that uh, make up uh, uh, the spectrin actin uh, network. So, uh, which gives kind of stiffness um, to uh, to the cells, and um, in this case, uh, what we could observe is that um, so uh, the one uh, so usually actually it's uh, this protein uh, or this transcript that is most uh, dominantly expressed in normal cells, and what we can observe is um, that uh, we observe this uh, transcript, which has in this case an additional exon. And the interesting thing is, so this additional exon is usually not transcribed, um, and it's also observed uh, um, in, um, or it's known that it's uh, supposed to be uh, skipped, but there is actually a lung cancer. This has also been observed that uh, there are transcripts of, um, of uh, this uh, gene, of this adosine gene, which overexpress exon 14 and um, those patients that have an overexpression of exon 14 show usually a poor uh, prognosis. Um, and this has been shown in lung cancer. Now, this is something that we see in this case, you know, dominantly now in different projects in ovarian cancer. So uh, that's definitely also a biomarker in that case uh, that uh, we are going to follow up um, soon. Um, and then uh, I just wanted to mention so that we developed um, a database uh, to, um, you know, to collect all the data and to make it available then uh, to the community. We called the database uh, Can Isonet, and uh, you can go on Can Isonet. The nice thing is that uh, we increase the data set now not only to cancer specific uh, um, cases, but we also have started to look into different uh, diseases. And maybe you can recognize here. So we have already a uh, data, data set on Alzheimer's disease, Bechet's disease, and there's also Parkinson's disease and so on. And the database looks like this. Uh, uh, so it provides a, I mean, a quite comprehensive uh, list of annotations. And I'm just showing you here a case of a heat shock protein, HSPH1, that we detected in Alzheimer's disease. And you can see, you know, uh, first of all, you see uh, for the data set, which are the most, um, you know, the transcripts that are most dominantly uh, it's uh, most dominantly switched, um, and uh, this HPSH1 would be here in this column. You see the disrupted interactions of the gene. You see uh, how many, um, you know, what is the relation in the expression profile between the transcript that we observed in normal cells and uh, the one that we observed in, cancer, uh, in the Alzheimer's disease, sorry, 
we have a network density score that tells you for the disrupted interaction how many how dense is uh, the network in that region where the protein is actually you know um, where the protein is um, uh, is switched in its uh, transcript and um, and this um, in this case for example you could um, I mean you could imagine what well, means imagine but in this case 22 percent there are only 22 percent of genes that have a denser network in their region than actually and actually this uh, heat shock uh, protein and this also helps you to assess uh, how much actually the impact will be of a transcript switch um, and and whether it will have a phenotypic effect in this case i would say it will definitely have a phenotypic effect because 78 percent is seems to be a very large number of interactions that would be disrupted and at the bottom you see uh, basically uh, the gene structure and you see there is one exon missing here, and that exon is part of, or encodes part of a binding domain, why uh, then we observe uh, these disruptions. We are working actually on other tools as well now. Um, so first of all, you know, uh, we are trying to do uh, structure predictions. So question is, you now these are all on sequence level, all the analysis. The question is, you know, uh, how do the proteins look like from a protein structure perspective? This might be interesting, especially for a drug isoform interaction database that we have developed. Um, so, uh, because, you know, to assess whether, for example, you know, when you give now a patient a drug, and then uh, to know that the drug will not bind because there is, uh, you know, the binding site for the drug is actually missing because the spliced isoform that is expressed lacks the binding site of the drug. So one could um, then uh, basically, um, you know, secure the patient from, uh, from, uh, from treatment um, that um, the patient is likely not going to respond to. And uh, what we have also started to do is to, um, we have started to look into full transcript sequences on a single cell level. So here um, data is uh, right now uh, generated and I'm quite uh, looking forward because in this case, I mean, we see already a lot of uh, changes in alternative splicing, but I'm pretty sure, I mean, I can tell you already the first preliminary data um, indicate that uh, there are 20% more novel transcripts or 20% of the transcripts that we detect are actually novel transcripts. So they have not been actually described uh, yet in the literature. And so there's a large pool of additional transcripts that, um, that are awaiting us uh, to, to, um, to, uh, you know, to, uh, to be analyzed. And finally, you know, also the validation with proteomics data is also something uh, that we are working on uh, right now. So I hope that I could convince you that splicing is often a quite underestimated mechanism and very few people actually are looking into splicing. When you say cancer, most people think about mutations, copy number alterations, like genomic, um, genomic biomarkers. But actually it seems like that splicing and the transcriptome, not in terms of uh, gene expression, but just in terms of the transcript that I expressed is really holding uh, a, you know, a new um, a peasant for you know, for new tr uh, therapies and, and uh, maybe hopefully also new drugs uh, that are developed in the uh, near future. And Roche, I was just talking to, uh, to the Roche people here, to Thomas. And uh, um, so there are like new drugs really coming up right now that are targeting uh, splicing. And I hope that more and more drugs will actually be, uh, will, will come to the market that can then address uh, splicing effects as I just showed you. So with this, I would like to uh, thank, first of all, uh, Tulai, uh, my PhD student, Christian, Holger, um, Hella, the Functional Genomics Center, Peter Schrammel, Van Wolscheid. So they all helped in one form or the other uh, in the different projects and also the Peacock uh, Consortium and the Tumor Profiler uh, Consortium. And uh, with this, uh, I'm, I'm done and would like to take questions if you have any. I changed my title to Data Science Meets the Clinic, and I want to show you a couple examples of qualitative approaches we've taken to actually design novel clinical trials based on evolutionary approaches. So just to get us started, um, here are my disclosures. I'm a co-founder of Harbinger Health. I'm on the scientific advisory board of Sapphire Eye, and I'm on the board of directors of Excelsior PSC. Um, 
this might not need any more introduction, given um, what you guys have been hearing about all day, but maybe just to level the playing field. I wanted to just point out that tumor evolution, and I mean the somatic evolution of tumor, where individual changes are accumulated over time in originally healthy cells, is a very important framework to think about how tumors change over time respond to treatment and become uh, resistant and more aggressive and start metastatic growth else place. And in addition, this framework allows us to come up with quantitative approaches to describe these changes over time. And what I want to do today is show you a couple examples of how we have used the framework of somatic evolution of cancer to try to come up with translationally helpful findings. And so, Generally, the way we think about cancer function um, is that over time, cells accumulate changes that can be genetic, epigenetic, can be different types of change or genomic changes that increase intratumor heterogeneity until the time of diagnosis, where we can then start treating, depending on the cancer type, it will be different care or individual treatment which um, exerts a therapeutic selection pressure, which then changes the fitness landscape within that tumor. And subsequently, um, the clonal dynamics of individual cell types of the tumor, um, some of them sometimes, unfortunately, to escape and then uncontrolled growth later on. And so this is a view of intratumor heterogeneity that also extends to intratumor heterogeneity in that every patient, um, of course, also differs from each other, not just each cell in each patient's tumor might differ from the other. And so we have taken this viewpoint of data science and evolutionary dynamics to come up with an integrative end-to-end -end approach of thinking about how we can help better understand how to treat patients better. And so that's the topic of the symposium. And so the, the approaches we've taken range from all the way from data collection and generation, both in model systems, in vitro systems, and patient um, cohorts, to data science approaches, including um, bioinformatic machine learning, modeling, and, and uh, statistical approaches, to eventually come up with a description of the somatic evolution of tumors that hopefully will have some translational impact. And so these mechanistic working models in the past we've used to design novel clinical trials. The first example I want to talk about is what we've done in glioblastoma um, in terms of designing new radiation treatment centers. But we've also done this in other cancer types. Here's an example from pancreatic cancer that looks at metastatic seeding and development of metastatic disease. And we've also done multiple other things, lung cancer, breast cancer, um, leukemias, and other solid uh, tumor types. So today, I want to discuss a little bit how we've investigated the causes and consequences of tumor evolution, specifically with this translation of impact. And so let's start to talk about primary glioblastoma. So glioblastomas, as you know, are the most common and malignant primary brain tumors. They're very aggressively treated with surgery, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy. And despite this treatment, unfortunately, not much has happened in terms of therapeutic options over the last almost half century. Um, the most recent disappointing result was the phase three trial of immunotherapy, which um, was a negative result. So um, addition of uh, immunotherapy didn't lead to increases in survival of um, glioblastoma. The last big news was the addition of timosolomides um, to radiation therapy, but that's already 30 years ago. So this is a very hard to treat tumor. Um, people have, of course, thought about modifying radiation schedulers. You might know that the standard of care is two gray per day, um, five days a week, six weeks total for a total of six gray for newly diagnosed um, glioblastoma in combination with timosolomides. And lots of people have actually tried to modify the uh, fractionation scheduler. People have tried hypofractionation, so many one gray doses. They've tried hypofractionation, fewer higher uh, gray doses. They've tried all at once, um, so 10 gray with all at once. All of this has largely resulted in, the, in very similar survival. The most important determinant seems to be the total amount of radiation administered rather than how much we give when. Yet, multiple things have happened in the field since the 
um, since some of these investigations, including a better molecular understanding of different subtypes and also intratumor heterogeneity, um, spearheaded by Brad Bernstein's group at, when he was at MGH, where he did single cell sick RNA sequencing of primary glibrosomal patient samples, showing that the individual molecular subgroups identified based on the cancer genome atlas analysis shown here, actually can be recapitulated by individual single cells in the tumor, suggesting that maybe these large transcriptional groups that were identified based on bulk RNA-seq data, right, driven by PDGF signaling, NF1, PG3 signaling, and EGFR signaling, might be driven by the most frequent subgroup of cells within the tumor. Nevertheless, these large transcriptional groups can be used to come up with accurate model systems of individual subtypes of glucosoma. And so the way we started thinking about translational impact by um, modifying radiation dose administration schedules was to collaborate with a lab that had developed a mouse model system originally in Harold Farmer's lab, but then his own lab, um, Eric Holland's lab, who is now the vice president of the Hatchet um, in Seattle. The way this model works is actually very interesting. It's a, a the receptor to an avian virus that's engineered into a specific type of cells in the mouse brain, which can then be targeted with this avian virus um, carrying a gene that you would like to have overexpressed this in that cell type in the brain. In this case, we chose PDGF because this recapitulates one of the major transcriptomer subgroups of the glucosoma, but this can be done with any molecular aberration. And it can also be introduced multiple times in different locations of the brain or the same location of the brain to introduce a tumor that looks histopathologically and molecularly very similar to PDGF. And what I always found interesting about this molecular approach of inducing gliomas in mice is that you can start with cell surface markers and GFP tagged um, to this gene, start visualizing how large the tumor really is, even though on an MRI, it will be very small. We might, in this case, only see kind of the tumor core with the highest density of tumor cells in it. Yet, in this particular mouse that, that we have plotted over here, we see that these tumor cell population has already spread over the entire hemisphere of that individual mouse, which is part of the reason of why these tumors are so hard to cure, and particularly why radiation alone might not be sufficient since that's only targeting the own um, in, of the radiation field, right, which, which is usually a little bit larger than what's visible on an MRI, but definitely not the entire and so the reason this mouse model is so helpful is because we can use it to understand dynamics of intratumor heterogeneity and the spatial architecture of individual cell types that reside in this perivascular niche within the tumor. So the perivascular niche is a specific microenvironmental um, environment where tumor cells are localized at specific areas relative to endothelial cells that line the blood vessels inside the tumors. And so using this mouse model, we can identify different subtypes of tumor cells. We have these brain tumor stem-like cells. They're really undifferentiated tumor cells that are more radio resistant and are localized next to these blood vessels and then give rise through asymmetric um, differentiation to these um, more differentiated tumor cells which we call the non-stem cell tumor. They're more differentiators. They're more radiosensitive also. And then we can also map the frequency of all of these other cell types that make up this microenvironment. And this is just a cartoon representation. Over here, we have an example of a cross-sectional slice of one of those mouse uh, tumors. You can see in the H&E stain that the blood vessel is kind of in between the middle. If you use Nestin or CD133, which is a mark of this brain tumor stem-like size, we can see that they're arranged kind of close to the blood vessel, while the other cells, these non-stem-like cells, are localized further away from the blood vessel. We can then use this mouse model to quantitatively describe how quickly different regions within the brain, different subtypes of cells respond to different amounts of radiation that's being administered. And this is just a representative example. We have lots of quantitative 
um, data sets from this mouse model, which models this pronural subgroup of, of GBM, that we can then use to build a computational modeling platform which describes how quickly these individual cell types respond to a certain amount of radiation, given at a certain fractionation schedule. And we can then predict how many cells we would have present in the mouse brain after a certain amount of time, given that schedule. And so this example here is um, our earliest work here, which was actually published in Cell in 2014, and which formed the basis of the clinical trial that I want to describe to you in a little bit. We've also done follow-up work that um, was published uh, more recently, and that takes other aspects of this microenvironment into account. And if we have enough time, I'm gonna show you at the end of this talk a little bit what we've done there. Now, the first thing we did was we used this parameterized mathematical modeling approach, and we, um, subjected it to simulated annealing optimization approaches to identify a schedule for 10 gray administered to these mice over a total of one week that would maximize survival. And so of course, you know, it's hard to predict life and death, but we can predict tumor cell number. So the optimization criterion here is to minimize the total number of cells after in this particular case, a week and a finishing radiation that um, would then determine which radiation dose administration schedule we should administer. And so this approach identified something that's very non-standard. It administers one gray, and uh, Monday at 8 a.m., Monday at 2 p.m., Monday at 5 p.m., Tuesday at 5 p.m., Wednesday at 3 and 5, and so forth. Now, this is a little bit of an uh, untraditional schedule, so it took some convincing of our collaborating lab to actually run the large mouse trial to validate these results, but they did. And what we found very interestingly is that while none of the other 10 gray schedules really seem to make a large difference in terms of survival of these different mouse groups, the red one here is standard, so two gray every day, same total amount of radiation as this green one here, which is this optimum given by the schedule over on the right. And interestingly, it led to survival that was non-significant worse than double the amount of radiation. So standard schedule administering 20 gray of radiation shown in this uh, pink line here. This is a cohort of between 10 and 15 mice each. Um, so what we seem to have found is a schedule that almost doubles the efficacy of each gray of radiation administered by just giving it a different time slots as identified with this optimized mathematical modeling approach. We then um, updated the model a little bit to um, also address hyper and hypofractionated results, identified a second optimum that was similarly ridiculous, um, slightly different from this optimum one, and again found reproducible extended survival still significantly better than this standard schedule, and in fact, a little bit more tightly distributed. So mainly driven uh, by the lack of this particular outlier drug that they had not optimum one. So we seem to have found something that increases survival, at least in this model, with all of the caveats of this mouth model that apply, obviously, um, that could be interesting to test the clinic. But before we did that, we wanted to know what the mechanism of extending survival might be. And what we had found based on the modeling predictions was that the mechanism of extending survival would be to enrich for this more slowly proliferating, more radio-resistant stem-like tumor cells. So here are the modeling predictions of um, the ratio of stem to differentiated tumor cells relative to the standard of care. And what you can see is that both of those optima actually enrich for these stem cells. And the mechanisms of why that leads to longer survival seems to be that those actually replicate more slowly. So while they're more radio resistant, they actually lead to slower rebounds in the tumor cell population, then leading to longer survival. And this also was validated with this mouse data where we can measure for all of the different arms that were treated with different radiation schedules, red is standard, uh, orange is this hyperfractionated, so more smaller doses, and then optimum one and optimum two, and these two optima that we identified using the model. And we have a significant enrichment of the site population as measured by the CB133 nest in assays um, within these mouse uh, brain samples that we took at the end of the schedules um, uh, that they were treated with. 
Now it is hard to validate this in humans. You can look at some retrospective data. This is from an Italian cohort of patients that were treated with radiation and adjuvant chemosolomides. But if you look at patients that had an enrichment of the stem cell fraction, again measured by CD133 in this patient population, after treatment, as opposed to those that had less enrichment of the stem cell population, then that actually does stratify these patients by survivor. Again, that's not a validation of the results, it's just supporting evidence that maybe something similar might be happening in patients as well. Now, based on these findings, we then decided to design a clinical trial. First, a, uh, a feasibility trial before we go to efficacy, just to show that this is feasible to implement in human patients. And this was a collaboration with the um, Dana Farber and Brigham and Women's Radiation Oncology Department, where we decided to compare the historical control of a trial called RTOG1205, which administers 35 gray in 10 fractions, so 3.5 gray every day for 10 days, in recurrent glioblastoma. So this is a re-irradiation patient population. Those that originally had received um, Timosoma plus radiation, 60 gray total, and now had a recurrence of their primary tumor and would be re-irradiated. And so the historical control is this RTOG trial. Um, and we wanted to see whether it would be feasible to implement a non-standard radiation um, administration schedule in, in this um, setting. Now, the practicality constraints that we had was we wanted to give a maximum of three fractions a day because we really can't have people sit around longer than maybe 12 hours, given that this is a very sick patient population. And we want to reduce the number of fractions as much as possible. So we want to have them come in as little as possible so that this is not much more um, difficult to implement um, for patients than this RTOG trial for heart trial. So we went away from the schedule that we had identified in the mouse population to search for something that would have similar prediction in terms of the fraction and volume change over time based on the mathematical model, but would be easier to implement. So we came across a schedule um, that is really not much worse. It's the Mars Leo schedule here of 28 gray in seven fractions for the first seven days, and then the last few days, nine gray in nine fractions. So the Mars Glio trial, which stands for um, optimizing treatment through mathematical model adapted radiation schedules in glioblastoma, um, this is the study number, started a couple of years ago with an objective to employ this novel mathematical model adapted radiation fractionation schedule for patients with glioblastoma. So what we did first was we um, performed statistical modeling to predict the magnitude of patient survival benefit based on previous studies that were done using preclinical evidence based on this specific mouse model and also similar mouse models to try to determine if the me mechanism for improved survival is actually generalizable to come up with most evidence possible before we implement patients uh, to convince ourselves that this is worth trying on curing patients. We then this, did this in silico treatment simulations to optimize the schedule for patients with the constraints in mind that I mentioned before. And then we implemented this feasibility trial um, to assess feasibility and safety. So this preclinical model looked at lots of different schedules, including the RTG 1205 schedule of 3.5 gray times 10, so one fraction a day for 10 days. Um, and each day was a 3.5 fraction. And a bunch of other schedules, for instance, 1.75 times 30, but also 4.52 times 5, and then 1 grade times 15, and other schedules. And we used this to arrive at the conclusion that this schedule that we eventually implemented at the, as a clinical trial, which is the 3.69 times 7, and then 1 times, times 9 at the end, actually would be more easily implementable because fewer total fractions and pretty unremarkable deviation from the optimum that we had identified um, in the beginning, um, but way easier to implement. And so this was also predicted to enrich for these stem-like cells, just like the original trial that we had performed in the past. And this was a paper that was published late last year in Neuro-Oncology that reported on the clinical trial results of this individual. So the schedule that we implemented 
was seven days of 3.96 grade one day. And then the last three days, three fractions each of one grade each, with a three and a quarter hour between. And again, this is a non standard schedule that was derived upon using this parameterized mathematical modeling approach using pre clinical database in this cosmetic. And so we enrolled 14 patients. Um, the power calculation showed that feasibility, if we, if we are convinced that feasibility would be um, administering the fraction within one hour of the days in which we have three schedules and three hours on the days where we have just a single fractionation, that would be deemed feasible. So that gives us a um, sample size of 14. So we enrolled 14 patients, um, median age 53 with these ranges here, um, four females, 10 males with all of the distributions of uh, mutation status, um, IDH, uh, wild type versus mutant status, um, and, and steroid exposure um, uh, as indicated here. They were all um, de novo GBMs, but all relapses after an original line of treatment. We, of course, have information on what treatments they received before being exposed to this radiation um, schedule. So uh, most of them um, had uh, bevacizumab before, even though we had three patients that didn't have that. All of them had um, timosolomide also ahead of time. Now, we can look at the progression free and overall survival within this patient population. And again, this was not a randomized trial to measure efficacy, right? Um, it was a feasibility and safety trial to see whether we can implement this schedule safely um, and feasibly in a patient population that's very sick. The um, historical control that we can compare to while uh, remembering that it's not a randomized trial, so with all the caveats for potential biases that apply for non-randomized control arm, show that this is um, similar overall survival to a control arm. Um, we can compare this in terms of a Cox regression result to um, this uh, kind of synthetic historical control, where in the progression-free survival we see um, a little bit of an improvement in our experimental arm. Um, that's not significant when we look at overall survival, but again, I wouldn't overinterpret that because it's not a randomized trial. What we did find though, that was significantly different was the pattern of response and failure of these patients that were treated on our experimental arm. So, so before we go into details of that, here's just a look at how long um, it took for patients to respond. Um, and relapse. So we had one patient that had progressive disease right away, uh, basically with no, no um, stable disease or um, relapse. We did see partial response and stable disease in everybody else um, with even a partial response for a pretty long time of uh, one particular patient. But the most interesting thing we learned, I think from this clinical trial, apart from the fact that it was feasible and safe to administer and everybody could stick to the schedule that we had designed, was that the patterns of failure were significantly different um, as compared to the RTOG trial for five trial. And that is we had only two patients that had their pattern of failure as a local recurrence. So this is the original tumor at the time of um, start of the mars trial. Um, this is an example of a patient that had a response here, partial response, and then recurrence within the field of radiation. Um, in comparison, that was very different in our um, uh, control arm, where 84% uh, of patients actually showed this pattern of failure. In our mars Clear trial, we predominantly had this out-of-field recurrence, where you um, irradiate the area where the tumor actually recurred within those patients at the start of mars Leo trial, had a response, and then eventually recurred outside the field of um, radiation. So there was a significant difference in this pattern of failure in the mars Leo as compared to the historical control arm, suggesting that we actually did steer the evolutionary dynamics of these tumor recurrences away from what would have happened um, if we had treated this with a standard schedule, suggesting that it, there must have been some efficacy with this additional 
high dose, three administrations a day, scheduled that we administered within this clinical trial, such that recurrence is actually distant from the field of radiation, which I thought was quite interesting. Now to think about chemo radiation scatters, um, to make these optimization schedules more applicable to newly diagnosed GBM, we have to take into account the spatial localization, which we didn't in this original model because we only thought about radiation at that point. And the reason we did that was because radiation, of course, is a field effect right? that applies the same amount of radiation to all of these different areas of the tumor, um, as long as they're within the field of radiation. Now, timosolomide is a chemotherapeutic that comes, um, that's a systemic treatment that comes through the blood vessel and then diffuses away from the endothelial cells. So we now need to include a gradient of diffusion from the blood vessel into the tumor. So the red cells here are the um, endothelial cells lining the blood vessel. The blood vessel comes out at us in this um, schematic representation of the spatially explicit model that we built for this uh, purpose. And so we have a diffusion model coupled with the spatially explicit stochastic model that we can then use to ask questions about how quickly individual cell types respond to chemo radiation. So chemotherapy given together with radiation at different schedules. And so we updated this model to not just look at radiation, both again in these differentiated tumor cells and these stem-like resistance cells, but also coupled it with a model that takes into account chemotherapy, which can either um, kill a cell immediately or it can survive and then age, um, such that we can keep the age structure um, as part of the description of this tumor cell population as well. And so the question we wanted to ask then was not just can we identify a new radiation oncology schedule um, that would administer radiation in a different way, but also how we could potentially use standard fractionation, since, since that's much easier to implement clinically, um, and only change the time difference between when timosolomide is administered and when radiation is administered in standard fractionation. And that choice we made because we wanted to have something that might be a little bit easier to implement in the clinic. And so using mouse PK and PD parameters for timosolomide and radiation, we identified that the optimum time between timosolomide and radiation would be 41 minutes. So you should administer uh, timosolomide 41 minutes to the mouse before irradiating at standard of care. And this is exactly what we tried in this um, mouse uh, trial that we ran in response to these findings compared to a uh, what we call a suboptimum, which is uh, predicted not to make any difference to standard of care, uh, where timosolomide is given eight hours post radiotherapy, which is um, often what patients get. Uh, usually they take timosolomide at bedtime on days of radiation. And so this made a significant survival difference again, which we then used to um, identify using human PK and PD parameters um, what the optimal distance would be between timosolomide and radiation given standard fractionation in humans, finding that it should be 57 minutes, so about an hour before radiation timosolomide should be administered, um, which then leads us to um, the next steps that we are planning using uh, all of these approaches. Phase two is efficacy. Um, we need to now randomize a large um, phase three where we want to enroll newly diagnosed GBM patients um, to test this uh, mouse glio determined feasible schedule against standard of care. We are also very interested in patient specificity since we could optimize for each patient individually what the optimum radiation schedule would be or also the optimum timosolomide relative to radiation schedule um, approach where we could take into account patient-specific imaging data, as well as, um, if feasible, ex vivo tumor assays from the diagnostic biopsy, um, which could be used to then molecularly characterize individual tumor cells um, over time and measure their response to individual uh, drugs as well. And that uh, could also enable us to do live adaptation to patient real-world constraints, such as what if somebody lives far away and actually needs a little bit longer to get to the day of to be irradiated. So maybe a 7 a.m. slot is not feasible. It needs to start at 10 a.m., for instance. And then finally, we are also thinking about concurrent therapy, um, timosolomide data that I just showed you, but also other things such as PARP inhibitors, immunotherapy, and others. Um, now, I think I'm out of time. So I will skip the second um, little story that I wanted to show you and just say that um, overall, um, we 
believe that taking the evolutionary dynamics of tumor cell populations into account is quite helpful to try to understand how we could treat patients in a maybe more personalized and also more um, in a way that might be able to prevent evolutionary outcomes that we don't want, for instance, evolution of resistance um, and other outcomes. And so uh, coming back to uh, you know, your very fitting introduction earlier, I'd like to point out that Topshansky used to think that nothing in biology makes sense unless see through lens of evolution, but I really think that applies to cancer biology as well. And we have to take the changing, the ever-changing uh, dynamics of these tumor cell populations into account if we want to really successfully um, treat patients for longer times. And so with that, big shout out to my lab and all the collaborators that have helped uh, work on these things over, over the years and a big shout out also um, to our funding. Thank you so much and happy to take any questions you might have.